we're just letting uh, participants join the room here. So we'll just give it a minute here for folks to, to get admitted into Zoom. Good evening. Leah, does it look like that's everybody let in? Yes, it looks like it is leveled off. Great. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Nate Pamplin, and welcome to our Puget Sound uh, Salmon Fishing Town Hall. Uh, I serve as our Director of External Affairs with the department and will help facilitate tonight's meeting. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us this evening. When we were preparing, for tonight's meeting and organizing the topics and material. We really wanted to gear our information to anglers and members of the public that might be new to Puget Sound uh, salmon fisheries management and help orient them to this issue and address some of the regulatory complexity. And my guess is that for, the, for those of you that are attending that are, that are the, the diehard salmon enthusiasts and you serve on our advisory groups or attend the various North of Falcon public meetings each season, that you'll also get something out of this too. Uh, Puget Sound salmon management is arguably one of the most complicated mixed stock fisheries in the world. And I know I pick up something new each time I hear from our team. For tonight, we've assembled our key executives and senior managers, biologists and scientists that work on this issue to help provide an overview We'll take a look back at the 2023 salmon seasons and some of the decisions made in season to achieve our conservation objectives. And we'll look ahead to see what's in store for 2024 in terms of opportunities and constraints. We'll also be sure to monitor the clock and reserve some time at the end to have a, a question and answer session and get to your questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Leah and ask her to walk through some of the logistics of using Zoom and then we'll introduce staff that are uh, doing the presentations before getting underway with some opening remarks from Director Susawin and Fish Program Director Cunningham, and then on to our staff presentations. Go ahead, Leah. Please note the following guidelines for our webinar. Upon entering the webinar, your microphone will be muted automatically. To ask a question, please use the raise hand feature. If you're joining by phone, dial star nine, and if you're join, joining by a computer, use the hand icon at the bottom of your screen. During the comment period, the host will enable you to unmute yourself. You can then unmute yourself by pressing the mute button or on your device or dialing star six on your phone. If you face any technical issues during the webinar, please let us know in the chat and we will assist you. We expect all participants to treat each other with respect and refrain from making personal attacks insults or threats. Please keep discuss discussions focused on the issues and questions at hand and avoid attacking individuals or organizations. The use of offensive, disrespectful, or derogatory language, including profanity, is strictly prohibited. To ensure a balanced discussion, please limit the length and frequency of your contributions to the conversation and assume positive intentions from those speaking and listen respectfully. Thanks, Nate. Great. Thank you, Leah. And uh, let's do a round of introductions. I'll start with the director and then director, if you just kind of point to somebody else and we'll move down through the list of presenters. All right, thank you, Nate. Kelly Susan, director of Department of Fish and Wildlife and I'll kick it over to Kelly Cunningham. Thank you, director Susan. Uh Evening everybody, thanks for being here. My name is Kelly Cunningham. I'm the director of the fish program and I'll turn it over to Kyle Addicts, our intergovernmental uh, salmon manager. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. As Kelly said, my name is Kyle Addix. I'm the Intergovernmental Salmon Manager for the WDFW Fish Program. I will pass it on to Mark Waltzell. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Mark Waltzell, Statewide Salmon and Steelhead Manager. Uh, next up is Dr. Marisa Litz. Thanks, Mark. I'm Dr. Marisa Litz. I'm a research scientist in the Fish Science Division with DFW, and I will pass it over to Kirsten Simonson. Thanks, Marisa. I'm Kirsten Simonson. I am the Puget Sound Recreational Salmon Manager for WDFW, and I will pass it down to uh, Dr. Derek Dapp. Thanks, Kirsten. Hello, everybody. I'm Derek Dapp. I work as a salmon modeler within the um, WDFW. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. 
Uh, so let's go to uh, opening remarks, uh, starting with Director Susawin and then turning it over to uh, Fish Program Director Cunningham. Go ahead. Thanks, Nate. Uh, my, my main objective here is to make sure I, I thank everybody for being here tonight. We know you're busy and, and it took some time out of your schedule for this, this event. This, this really is a huge deal. This is the beginning of our annual North of Falcon setting season settings. Uh, and it really is the core of how, how we manage at least fisheries around salmon. Everybody here knows salmon are, are an icon in the Northwest. They're a foundation for our economy, a foundation for our culture. If you're here tonight, you're likely an avid angler and very interested in how things are gonna roll out this year. And uh, we have the team here that sets those seasons for you. These guys, I'll tell you, I've been here about five years now and every year I'm more and more impressed at how hard they work to find every opportunity they can. Uh, you know, people concerned about some closed doors, I'll tell you what's going on behind those closed doors is these guys eking out every bit of opportunity they can within our mandate. Our mandate requires that we take conservation first. Our, our primary goal is to sustain these runs so that we can have these opportunities now and in the future. Your grandkids and their grandkids, we want out there doing the same thing, hopefully even more so than today. Uh, that results in some ch some changes during season and some shortened seasons, and we know that's frustrating. Uh, you folks are, especially, as I said, if you're here tonight, you're one of our, probably our more avid anglers. You're making plans a year in advance. And it's, it's tough when we see those changes. But I can tell you that every one of those is agonized over. We do not take those changes or especially shortening seasons lightly, but we're in a spot where we feel we need to for conservation. Uh, and so we we make those tough, tough decisions. Uh, it can be confusing for folks too. So hopefully tonight we'll get a little better feeling for all that. We, we work in, as Nate said earlier, a mixed stock area from the ocean all the way to that terminal area. There are multiple stocks there. So you might be having great fishing because you have a healthy stock available, but it's mixed in with a constrained stock, a stock that's not doing well. And we have to protect that weak stock in order to make sure we have a sustainable fishery going forward. And so it doesn't always add up if you don't know all the, the mathematics that goes in the background. So, so I, I appreciate you all being here. Uh, we're going to go into some depth. As Nate said, we'll make sure for those that are just joining us for the first time can can get a good foundation and those that have been here for a while can learn uh, something new, we hope. Thank you for being here. Uh, we really do take your input seriously. When we make those changes, we try to work with our advisory groups and the public. We're here tonight because we want to know, as these folks are working to, to grind out those seasons, we want to make sure we're doing that in a way that meets what you want. Uh, we've got limitations. We can't offer everything. So we want to make sure what we offer is in line with what your, your desires are as best we can. So with that, I will turn it over to the program that actually does the work, and that would be Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it. I'll, I'll be really brief. Um, appreciate those, Kelly and Nate, your comments early on about the complexity of these fisheries. I think folks would be hard pressed to find a more complex fishery management regime than, than what exists uh, for us, all of us here in, in Washington. And I greatly appreciate and agree with the sentiments associated with the amount of work that goes into um, prosecuting these fisheries and the level of talent and dedication that WDFW has working hard for the benefit of Washington's anglers and uh, um, making sure that we got our, our conservation objectives in front of us as we, as we prosecute these fisheries. One of the things I wanna share is that this, this, this meeting, this town hall is, is new, right? Um, we have a really extensive public process associated with the North of Falcon salmon season setting uh, workload. That, that process and those meetings can be found on our website. Um, it's, it's wild and woolly is, is one way to put it. It starts out fast and furious. And as we near the end, it becomes, uh, um, I guess what I would say is if you're, if you're a member of the general public trying to track this process, it's hard on a good day. And as we get towards the finish line, it's really hard because things happen quickly. Um, and I know that causes a lot of frustration. For, for you all who are trying to track the process or even, even understand it. So this meeting tonight is our attempt to try to, as, as Kelly and Nate mentioned, <clears throat> provide 
some insight into what goes into the salmon season setting process every year and um, the uh, the uh, the issues that we have to deal with in terms of of managing these fisheries and, and agreeing on these fisheries. So this is new for us. This kind of kick, as Kelly mentioned, it's kicking off our, our uh, North of Falcon process. We hope you find it valuable. Um, for us, it's been really important to work with our public affairs folks because we can get mired into the weeds really quickly. And it's been really helpful to have our public affairs folks kind of pull us up and have us talk about these issues in a way that might be more um, digestible, if you will, by you all. That said, we got some time at the end here. Um, we're hoping for some engagement. We're hoping for some good questions from you all. Not that there's a bad question, because again, it's complex. It's 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 it takes a takes a few shots at it to to maybe understand exactly what we're talking about. So please don't be shy about raising your hand. Um, if we don't get through everything tonight, uh, you know how to get a hold of us. We're happy to engage with you. Uh, if you've got additional questions after the fact, but we want to be respectful of people's time. And uh, we got a couple of hours scheduled together. We're going to do our best to stay on track, but please don't let that limit your, your questions. And with that, um, I'll stop taking up valuable airspace and I'll turn it over to Kyle, who will get the program underway. Thank you all. Thanks, Kelly. And as we get the slide presentation pulled up, um, just to clarify, we're going to get through our presentation and, and hold questions till the end. We want to make sure we get through the information, but we're going to try to get through it to leave that time at the end to answer questions. So as you all know, we're here for um, the first I know of, of its kind, Puget Sound Salmon Fishing Town Hall. I'm going to kick us off on the next slide with just an overview of our annual process for planning our salmon fisheries, planning and implementing our salmon fisheries. And this is in the form of a timeline that starts in January of each year. I like to think of this as a circular process that never really has an end, kind of like the salmon life cycle diagrams you've probably seen in the past. But as we move into our process, it really happens in January and February of each year as our state and tribal staff develop salmon run forecast. So they use all the data we have on past salmon returns, sit down and figure out what our best estimate of the number of each species and stock of salmon that will return in the upcoming year are. Um, as we get to the end of February, we release those forecasts. We'll have a big public kickoff meeting you'll hear about later where we um, tell the public what all those forecasts are. And from there, we jump right into the Pacific Fishery Management Council process. I'll say a little bit, of, a little bit about that more later, um, but this is a process where we work with the other states, with tribal and federal fisheries managers, to develop preliminary options for ocean fisheries based on the current year's forecast. As we move further into March, um, we have a long series of public meetings where we take input on what the public would like to see for fishing seasons. Um, of course, they have to be within line of what our preseason forecast and our conservation objectives are, but we have meetings broken out regionally around the state for the Washington coast, for the Columbia River, and for Puget Sound. And as we move through that process, we start to, de to develop draft regulations for state fisheries based on all of that public input, our co-manager negotiations, and what the PFMC ocean fisheries will look like. We have a pretty complex um, conservation objective and legal framework that we also have to fit those fisheries within. So we have conservation objectives, limits on the impact we can have on all of our species and stocks. We have the USD Oregon and USD Washington court cases and all of the agreements that have come out from those in the years. We have the Magnuson-Stevens Act for federal fisheries. We have the Endangered Species Act for species that are listed under the ESA. When we have state law and the Pacific Salmon Treaty that we also, also have to be mindful of. Next slide. As we get into early April, the Pacific Fishery Management Council will have its second meeting and they'll adopt final recommended regulations for ocean fisheries. And at that time, we can cement our plans for all of our inside fisheries in Puget Sound, coastal Washington, and the Columbia River. As we put all of those fisheries together, they have to meet all of those conservation requirements and be within the legal framework. In the recent past, um, for Puget Sound fisheries in particular, we've had to submit our fisheries plan for Puget Sound fisheries to the National Marine Fisheries Service for environmental review and approval. I'll speak a little bit about that later. And then as we move into May and June, we finish the formal Administrative Procedure Act process for um, adopting new fishing regulations. We have additional public hearings um, and eventually the director adopts the fishing regulations for the year. 
once all that's done, we can actually start implementing our fisheries around the state. And on the left at the bottom here, you see the co-management process, which goes on throughout the, the season development process, as well as the fishery management and implementation process. We implement those seasons. We do pretty intense monitoring of, of what the catch and encounters in those, in those fisheries are. And sometimes we have to modify those seasons based on what we see in the fisheries and what we learn about returning run sizes of salmon. And on the right side, you see a, a sort of separate but linked process that goes on. As fisheries end and salmon escape into natural spawning grounds and hatcheries, we're assessing those returns, um, those fish, lay their eggs, juveniles hatch, head back out to, to marine waters at some point. We're monitoring how many juveniles are leaving freshwater. And then we have a ton of environmental data that's collected, Not most of that not collected by WDFW, but a lot of organizations collecting that data. All of those things drive our, stock, our salmon stock assessment data sets. And it, as we collect all that data, again, it's an annual cycle. That data drives the forecast that will be developed for future years as we plan fisheries. Next slide. So tonight we're focused on a really small geographic area within this map. We're focused on Puget Sound and the inside waters of Puget Sound, WDFW and the, and the Western Washington Treaty Tribes co-managed fisheries. Um, there's similar processes that are going on on the coast of Washington and the Columbia River. All of that kind of falls under the umbrella of what we call North of Falcon. And North of Falcon refers to an area off the a point off the Oregon coast called Cape Falcon. You can see it here on this map. And the, the forum where we plan and manage our water, our Washington fisheries, we refer to as north of Cape Falcon. As we move off into the federal ocean waters off the coast, there's another organization, the Pacific Fishery Management Council, that's responsible for planning fisheries in those waters. And we also have an international process, um, the Pacific Salmon Commission that was formed under the Pacific Salmon Treaty of 1985. Um, we work with Canadian and Alaskan governments to plan fisheries, and we have agreements in that treaty that specify limits on impact we can have on Canadian stocks as well as our own stocks. It's not a planning body as much as the preseason or the North of Falcon process, but we have to plan all of our fisheries to be consistent with the requirements of that Pacific Salmon Treaty. Um, one of the things I mentioned that, that really drives our forecast each year, our environmental factors. And I have the honor of passing it off now to Dr. Marisa Litz, who is gonna to talk to you about the ocean outlook for our salmon this year. Thanks, Kyle. And um, so I'm just gonna provide some context, both in terms of the atmosphere and the oceanographic conditions that were impacting salmon in 2023 and looking forward into 2024. So. Um, my next slide is a talk over outline. So I'm going to really briefly go over an update on some of the physical conditions. So temperature, uh, the El Nino we're currently experiencing, uh, marine heat, heat waves. Uh, I'm going to talk about some notable biological observation, mostly in the ocean, and then the NOAA environmental indicators, also known as the ecosystem salmon stoplight chart. And uh, take home messages from just this short presentation is that climate variability is going to continue to impact salmon returns in 2024 and that the stressors affect both the freshwater and the marine life history stages of salmon. And then the current El Nino that we are in, it's still unknown the effect that this gonna, is going to have, but um, we'll, we'll have more uh, resolution as we get into the spring. So next slide. So just want to couch this presentation um, acknowledging that um, 2023 experienced the warmest land and ocean surface temperatures on record going back to 1850. Um, and this means really two things. It means we're really in a place in the climate where we've never been before. And it also means that it's becoming uh, more challenging for scientists to use uh, past observations to predict what's coming next. Next slide. And we're currently in an El Nino and um, forecasters are anticipating that this could reach historically strong levels. One of the strongest El Ninos going back to 1950s. But uh, the good news is that these impacts may be short lived. And just a reminder, so this plot is sea surface temperature anomalies. So uh, deviations from the average. So redder colors are warmer than average, darker colors are cooler than average. 
but El Nino starts at the equator. Um, and this, this is important because it, it really affects uh, atmospheric circulation around the equator and it can affect weather patterns globally, but it really is uh, an equator phenomenon. And usually how we, how we see those effects in the Pacific Northwest are disruptions to uh, atmospheric rivers and weather patterns, but also through the movement of warm surface ocean uh, northward into our region. Next slide. Uh, and we're coming off, interestingly enough, we're in an El Nino currently, but we're coming off uh, a three cycles of La Ninas that started in August 2020. And La Ninas are the opposite of El Nino. They tend to bring cooler, wetter conditions into the Pacific Northwest, and it's cooler at the equator. And this, this tends to be really good for Pacific Northwest salmon, whereas the El Nino tends to be bad for Northwest salmon. Uh, next slide. And then we also know that multiple El Nino, so up to five per century, can really cause ecosystem tipping points that can harm fish. So this plot here just shows uh, various cycles, more positive the El Ninos and more negative of the, uh, of the La Nina cycles, strong ones over the past uh, few decades. And you can see the last really large El Nino we had was 2015 and 2016. And then since then, we've been really oscillating, switching back and forth from El Nino and La Nina phenomenon. And the last three years prior to this year, we had this three-peat La Nina. So something that's typically beneficial for Pacific Northwest salmon. And then we transitioned right away into this historically strong uh, El Nino that we're still in. Next slide, please. And the uh, forecasters from NOAA are predicting this, this El Nino will actually be fairly sh um, short-lived and it will end so that will fall below the 0.5 sea surface temperature anomaly at the equator. Uh, they're anticipating this will happen in, in the springtime between April and June. And not only that, but the predictions as that El Nino is, uh, we're getting more and more confident that it's going to be decreasing in strength, that we're going to transition and phase right into another La Nina by August. Next slide. Uh, so El Nino, I mentioned it's an equator phenomenon, but there were also atmospheric and oceanographic things that are happening in the Pacific Northwest and in the North Pacific and the Gulf of Alaska where salmon are um, feeding and growing prior to returning to their natal streams in Puget Sound. And one of these things is the warm blob. So the warm blob sets up when there's a ridge of high pressure it parks itself over the North Pacific, and there's really little storm activity. Uh, surface waters heat up. Um, they're not, there's not a lot of overturn of those surface waters bringing nutrients to the surface and fueling a lot of the phytoplankton and zooplankton that feeds the trophic web. And in 2014, 2015, uh, many people were aware of this large phenomenon of the blob because it was combined with an El Nino and it led to really dramatic declines in the returns of salmon, the size of salmon that returned and the fecundity. It was a pretty dramatic and devastating. And we've been slowly recovering from that event, but it's also important to recognize that blob events really are happening annually and they can be tracked um, and compared in terms of their size and their duration. So each year we, we are having these blob effects and. Most recently in 2023, the blob looked very similar to the blob that occurred in 2014, right before that El Nino. But next slide, the good news is that with all this recent storm activity uh, and cool weather, uh, most of that warm surface water has dissipated. So there really isn't a current heat wave. Um, so what you do see coming up from the south is a little bit of that warm water. So those little patches of red that could be related to the El Nino and deeper um, thermal climb uh, Kelvin waves that are bringing that equatorial uh, warm water north and bringing with it kind of a suite of subtropical and tropical species. Next slide. So not only are marine factors of impacting fish, but we also know um, that the weather patterns are also impact our river systems. And we, all, we, know, we were worried at the end of 2023, uh, as salmon were making their spawning migration, that it was fairly, there was a, we were in a drought in many parts of the state, and we were desperately in need of some rain. 
And so as January started, we were about 50% of normal in terms of our snowpack across the state. Now, within one week, um, that really shifted to being 75, 80% of normal. And, uh, and that, that position has really maintained itself through now. I know it feels like it, we've had more precipitation than we like, but we're, 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 we're get, creeping up to be more average, 100% um, of normal. Next slide. And the outlook over the next month, as a result of us still being in this uh, El Nino, is that we are expected to have uh, warmer than average temperatures and below average precipitation. Next slide, please. Um, and as a result of some of these uh, biological responses to the warming ocean over the last three years, one of the things that anglers particularly have noted is that um, we've seen this impact or this uh, incidence of more subtropical and tropical species coming up into our marine waters. So things like opa caught off of uh, seaside, tropical fishes like short bill spearfish, uh, bluefin tuna washing up on Orcas Island. Um, and in fact, we even had a 21 pound mahi-mahi caught off, off Washington that broke the state record this year. Uh, other, other things that we've been noting is the European green crab is invading into uh, parts of Southeast Alaska, as well as Hood Canal. Um, and we're seeing uh, as subtropical and tropical fish come up from the South, we're also seeing salmon spawning farther and farther north into the Arctic, where they're considered an invasive species. Uh, next slide. And so NOAA, each year, they produce this salmon indicator stoplight chart. It's uh, a red light, green light um, color coding, which is you know fairly intuitive. So green is good, red is bad. Uh, each year corresponds in, in each column to a year that out migrating smolts hit the ocean. And each column is a particular indicator. And see, these are either really large scale atmospheric or oceanographic indicators that talk about El Nino or temperature. There's more local factors. And then there's also biological factors. So the prey of salmon or the prey of the prey of salmon. Um, and you can see through 2015, through 2017, a lot of red, those terrible years for salmon. But the last three years, 21 through 23, uh, we've seen a lot more green and yellow. And in fact, uh, this last year was ranked 11 out of the 26 years. So a very average to good year. Uh, and the last slide, please. So just to conclude, uh, so the ocean conditions uh, were really favorable for smolts from 2021 through 2023. And in fact, things like sea surface temperature uh, were some of the best of the 26 year time series. Um, the biological indicators were just average in 2023. Uh, but the good news is that the El Nino signals, so uh, sort of really warm sea surface temperatures, a lot of the um, you know, die-offs and blob signals have not yet reached Puget Sound. And the transition to El Nino Southern Oscillation neutral by spring, and not only that, but a transition to La Nina by the summer, could really limit any uh, negative consequences that the El Nino may have going into 2024. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kyle and the rest of the team. I hit the mute button because my dogs were excited running around upstairs because my wife got home. Um, thanks, Marisa. I'm gonna walk you through a few slides now the first are going to provide just kind of an overview of mixed stock fisheries. You've heard that ter term used a couple of times already. Explain what we're talking about when we say mixed stock fisheries. And then going to give a brief update on the Puget Sound Chinook Harvest Management Plan and the Stillaguamish payback provision within that plan. Next slide. So this is just a map of our marine catch record card areas for salmon around Washington. Um, these are had been around for a long time and they divide, divide the marine waters up into 13 or so areas. Areas out on the Pacific Ocean start with area one down around Il Waco, and that's off the, off the mouth of the Columbia River. It actually spans over into, into Oregon waters all the way down to Cape Falcon, which the point I mentioned earlier. And they walk one, two, three, four up the coast to Nia Bay, the more, most northern of the ocean areas. Um, Nia Bay goes all the way up to the U.S.-Canada border, so obviously the white at the top of the map are Canadian waters and then Vancouver Island north of that. 
We're here tonight to talk more about the Strait of Juan de Fuca and Puget Sound. So walking into the Strait of Juan de Fuca with Marine Area 5 off CQ, Marine Area 6, which extends from west of Port Angeles all the way over to the west shore of Whidbey Island. Marine Area 7 is the area around the San Juan Islands and up to Point Roberts and the Canadian border up there. Then the Area 8 is divided into, into two areas, 8-1 and 8-2, with 8-1 being the area of Skagit Bay and Deception Pass, and Area 8-2 being the Everett area, Port Susan and Port Gar Gardner. Mar Marine Area 9 is the Admiralty Inlet area. It covers a pretty big area um, from that western tip of Whidbey Island all the way down to the border with the Area 10, as well as up to the border with the Everett area. Marine Area 10 is the area between Seattle and Bremerton. Marine Area 11 is the Tacoma Vashon Island area. Um, Marine Area 12 is Hood Canal, and that's all waters um, south of the Hood Canal Bridge. And finally, Marine Area 13 or South Puget Sound is all waters south of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. All of our salmon fisheries in these waters are mixed stock fisheries, meaning that as we go fish for any species of salmon, we're encountering and catching fish that are headed for river systems throughout Puget Sound, for systems in Canada, for systems on the Washington coast, for systems on the Columbia River. So it's really complicated to plan these fisheries because we're not only um, encountering fish that are headed for a single river in Puget Sound, we have 15 management units with multiple populations in some of those management units of Chinook salmon returning for the river. So we have to plan our fisheries to limit the impacts on all of those populations. And there's a great deal of uncertainty um, connected to that. Next slide. So this is a super simplified example, but to try to put things in perspective, if we have a run of 100 fish that's returned for some river in Puget Sound, they're protected by the Endangered Species Act. They're listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, but we have to limit our impact of those on those. Next slide. So and this is just an example, but the we might have to pass 90 of that 100 fish or 90% onto the spawning grounds to escape and spawn naturally. That leaves 10 fish or 10% that we can either harvest or have as incidental mortalities in our fisheries. Next slide. Those 10 fish have to be split up between state and tribal fisheries. So five of those might go to state fisheries and five of those might go to tribal fisheries. Next slide. Um, those five fish don't swim in a nice protected bubble together and move through Puget Sound in some predictable way. They're mixed up with all of the other wild stocks in Puget Sound, as well as all the hatchery fish that we're actually trying to harvest in our fisheries. So it's very, very hard to estimate what our, in, what our impacts on each of those stocks are, but critical to us, uh, critical that we do that um, to limit our impacts to the ESA stocks. And the last slide. So again, we're trying to avoid that one relatively rare wild fish from one population in Puget Sound while we harvest all of the hatchery fish and other species of salmon that we're harvest that we're targeting as we move through Puget Sound. And those poor status stocks being encountered in these mixed stock fisheries are typically what limits our opportunity in those mixed stock fisheries, even though we're trying to harvest those more abundant stocks in hatchery fish. Next slide. I mentioned that Puget Sound Chinook salmon are listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened, and that means that we need federal authorization for any activity that takes those fish. And under the ESA, take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. So when we implement fisheries in Puget Sound that are encountering these listed Puget Sound Chinook, we need ESA authorization from the federal government to do that. For a number of years, the Puget Sound co-managers have had to seek one year ESA authorization for our fisheries in Puget Sound marine and freshwater areas. In 2022, the co-managers submitted a long-term fishery management plan seeking ESA authorization for 10 years for our Puget Sound fisheries. This plan sets limits on the annual allowable impact levels or take for individual population of ESA listed Chinook and there are population specific impact levels within that plan. And those levels are variable depending on the abundance of adult Chinook returning to individual populations each year. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is the federal agency um, with responsibility, ESA responsibility for Pacific salmon is conducting their review process for the co-manager plan. 
and expects to have it done prior to the start of 2025 fisheries in May of next year. That means that we'll have to have another one year authorization for 2024 fisheries, which we're about to start planning that begin in May of this year. Um, NOAA expects to have their draft environmental impact statement out for public con comment this summer, as well as their draft companion ESA review. Then they have to review those comments and prepare their final decision subsequent to that. Um, but again, that, that process is ongoing and we hope by next year we'll have a, a long-term fishery management plan for our Puget Sound fisheries in place. Next slide. One new feature of the management plan submitted in 2022 is what we call the Stillaguamish payback provision. Um, it's something that was developed to focused on one of the most critical low abundance stocks we have in Puget Sound, Stillaguamish Chinook. And its purpose is to ensure that fisheries are implemented consistent with the management strategy that we develop through North of Falcon and describe each year in the list of agreed fisheries. So part of our annual uh, process is we develop what's called a list of agreed fisheries with the Puget Sound tribes. And it's really just a one year fishing plan outlining what the state and tribal fisheries for the upcoming year will look like. Um, we then need to implement our fisheries to make sure we stay within the limits that we intended we, when we designed that list of agreed fisheries. So each year we'll evaluate non-tribal and tribal fisheries in Puget Sound that have a, a measurable impact on Stillaguamish Chinook. And we'll calculate an aggregate in-season estimated mortality on Stillaguamish Chinook and care, compare that to what we planned in the pre-season using our fishery planning models for all the non-tribal fisheries in Washington and for all the tribal fisheries in Washington. The review period's off a little bit from our fishery planning year because as we start to plan fisheries, we still have some ongoing. So for 2024, we'll be looking at the winter of 22, 2023. So fisheries that went through April of 2023 plus summer fall fisheries in 2023. And if we see that the estimated in-season Stillaguamish mortalities are greater than what we predicted pre-season, then we will reduce our impact on Stillaguamish mortalities in the upcoming season by that total overage. And this is will be done for state and tribal fisher, fisheries separately and it's what we call a conservation payback. So if we exceeded our allowable impact, we'll reduce our impact in that future year, but those fish will go unharvested. They won't be used by anyone else in fisheries. Um, the plan says that we'll evaluate that payback by about February 7th of each year. And um, that's gonna happen in the next week or so. And this will be the first year that we've implemented that payback provision. So a lot of people have asked questions about that and where we are, where we are in the development. We just about have it developed and are about to, to take that, do that review and look at that first year of 2024. With that, um, that all this will be done in the framework of our fishery model. Our FRAM model that Derek's gonna talk about next is our critical tool for developing our Chinook fisheries as well as our coho fisheries each year. It's also the assessment tool we use to go back and look and see how we did compared to what we planned pre-season on these stocks. And with that, I will, Pass it off to Dr. Derek Gap, our FRAM modeling lead. Thank you for that introduction, Kyle. Uh, hello, everybody. Today, I'm going to speak a little bit to the preseason modeling process. By the end of my section, I'm hoping that folks will have an understanding of some of the key terms that we use in the modeling, how we evaluate modeling inputs against um, management objectives, and some of the challenges that we're likely to face in 2024 preseason for Chinook. Um, so next slide, please. To start off, let's talk a little bit about the fishery regulation assessment model, also referred to as FRAM, um, as Kyle was mentioning. FRAM is a tool that we use to parse uh, mixed stock fishery impacts into stock age components. FRAM can be used to evaluate fisheries in a given year um, and see if they're compliant with management objectives. For anybody who might be um, interested in more information on FRAM after we get through this presentation, uh, note that there's a link to the model's documentation and code on screen now. Next slide, please. So FRAM is used for both uh, pre-season and post-season assessment of fishery impacts on stocks. In the pre-season, we're using forecast abundances and anticipated fishery catches for the coming year to plan fisheries that meet management objectives. In the post-season, we're using actual catch estimates of, um, of salmon and also actual estimates of salmon returns to evaluate how fisheries that occurred um, impacted stocks in the model in both evaluation exercises, that is the preseason and postseason, FRAM calculates salmon mortality for both landed and released encounters. FRAM also examines escapement, and through the combination of those things, we can estimate exploitation rates. 
We'll explore what exploitation rates are um, in coming slides, but I should note that, fram, that FRAM is only used for Chinook and Coho. Next slide, please. Thank you. Prior to diving into the modeling, I think it's really important to define a few key terms. Um, and first on screen here is uh, our first term, which is uh, adult equivalent or AEQ mortalities. An adult equivalent rate is applied to Chinook only. It's not applied to Coho. And it represents the likelihood of a fish from a particular stock and at an age of returning to the river um, and at an age of returning to the river as an adult if it's not killed in a fishery. To calculate this, uh, adult equivalence takes into account both natural mortality and maturation rates. Um, I guess one thing that I commonly hear confused is that um, one AEQ mortality represents an escapement change in the coming year by one fish. Um, however, that's not actually how it works. Um, what it actually represents is that one AEQ mortality represents an escapement change of one fish at some point throughout the fish's life cycle. So for example, you can imagine that for some stock at age two, um, if the modeling were to assign a stock in AEQ rate of 50%, um, if fishing doesn't occur, um, then there's a 50% chance that that fish will return to the river. However, because that fish that we're using in this example is an age two, it may return to that river in that year as an age two, but it's more likely to return potentially as an age three, four, or five in future years. Next slide, please. It was important to define what an, AE, um, an adult equivalence was in the last slide because it's the metric that we use to develop exploitation rate estimates. An exploitation rate es represents the percentage of the um, adult equivalent population taken by a fishery or by a grouping of fisheries. And I should mention that most management objectives for both Chinook and Coho are defined in terms of exploitation rate. And once again, exploitation rates are stock specific. The equation for an exploitation rate, you can see kind of at the bottom of the right of the screen here, and it's simply the number of adult equivalent mortalities from either a fishery or a grouping of fisheries um, divided by the adult equivalent mortalities of all fisheries uh, plus escapement. So in this case, the denominator represents adult abundance. Maybe to walk through a fictitious example, imagine that for a particular stock, there was an escapement of 100 fish, and I'm looking at the table to the right now. Imagine that fisheries along the West Coast impacted the stock, and we estimate that there is 10 AEQ mortalities occurring in Alaska, 10 in British Columbia, 10 in Washington, 10 in Oregon, and 10 in California. So if we were calculating a total exploitation rate, that is um, the exploitation rate for all fisheries along the West Coast, we would get 50 AEQ mortalities as a numerator. And then for the denominator, we would get 50 AEQ mortalities added to 100 fish in escapement. This would result in 50 over 150, or a total exploitation rate of 33%. We could similarly calculate an SUS, or Southern US, exploitation rate, and that metric would include um, fishery mortalities only from Washington, Oregon, and California. Basically, a Southern US rate represents anything south of Canada. So it would be um, uh, 30 AEQ mortalities divided by the total adult population of 150, or in this case, a Southern US exploitation rate of 20%. Next slide, please. So I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. And so a lot of you probably have some experience with what a management objective is. However, for folks who are new on the call today, I'm gonna to use uh, Dungeness Chinook as an example um, for management objectives. Many stocks have a low abundance threshold, also referred to as an LAT. And as the abundance of the stock changes, so too does the allowable exploitation rate. In the case of Dungeness, the low abundance threshold is uh, 500 fish in escapement. So if the stock abundance is greater than 500 fish in escapement, then fisheries are managed to an exploitation rate limit of 10% in the Southern US. However, if that escapement falls below 500 fish, then fisheries must be managed for a critical exploitation rate of uh, 6% in the Southern US. Um, this one's a relatively simplistic stock example with some stocks having multiple tiers of abundance threshold um, and therefore exploitation rate objectives. Next slide, please. On screen now, you'll see what the Chinook management objectives were for the 2023 uh, preseason planning process. The exploitation rate metric used, as you can see, uh, varies across stocks and at different abundances. However, highlighted in green here is the Stiligwamish River, which has been kind of our primary constraining stock for sport fisheries in Puget Sound for the last five years. We've also highlighted a few other stocks that have been occasionally constraining in the last five years in blue. Uh, maybe going down the list, uh, Nooksack Springs, Skagit Summer Falls, Skagit Springs, Snohomish, Nisqually, uh, Skokomish, and Midhood Canal. Next slide. 
So uh, we don't know what the management objectives for Chinook and Coho will be in 2024 um, because they're dependent upon regional abundance forecasts. That forecast processing is occurring now, and we hope to have management objectives identified in the next month or so. However, we did really want to highlight one trend that we've observed in the past few years for Chinook fisheries, which is that Chinook catches per day um, that the fishery is open for have, have really increased in recent years, and particularly when we look at some areas. Um, it's really great to see increasing rates of angler success and participation, but it's likely that many of our Chinook management objectives for 2024 will be similar to those in 2023. And that means that there are going to, um, uh, if there are similar exploitation rate objectives during fishery planning, um, and then we would need more impacts to have longer seasons, uh, those greater impacts might not be available. So to demonstrate, um, to demonstrate kind of this issue that we're running into um, uh, on screen here, we're going to look at Marine Area 5 in the winter, um, which Marine Area 5 is situated between CQ River and Lyre River, as an example. Next slide. So on screen here, you see until about 2016, there was a trend where Area 5 winter uh, Chinook fisheries would be open for approximately 70 to 85 days. Typically during that period, they'd catch less than 500 Chinook. Uh, last year, the fishery was open for just 10 days and caught over 1,300 Chinook. Uh, where this was historically a pretty uh, small fishery, um, factors such as angler success, angler participation, and effort shifts from closed areas have really contributed to a much higher modeled impact needed to run some of the same seasons that we might have seen historically. Next slide, please. And even though Area 5 winter is a good example, um, you can see that here, I believe it's in the green line. There are several other examples where you can see this trend throughout Puget Sound. Um, uh, for example, um, if we're looking at area 11 uh, in June, which is represented in red here, you can see how that, that catch per day pattern. Um, area 11, just for reference, is the Tacoma area. And we could also look at area seven in the summertime. Uh, that's this blue line here, uh, which represents the San Juan area. In all three of these fisheries, um, the impacts that you might need to model a season are very different in recent years than we've seen historically. Next slide, please. So given the limited impacts that we've got available and the recent catch trends, our aim is to really maximize fishing opportunity while meeting conservation objectives. We go through the pre-season pre planning process, working with the public to consider recreational priorities and examine trade-offs with certain management areas. Typically, this is done uh, via scenario modeling tools for Chinook and Coho in each area. And we host these tools online during public meetings so that the public can work with us to develop fishing scenarios. An example from last year, you can see in the table below where WDFW examined how different changes to Marine Area 5 in the summer would potentially affect predicted Stiligwamish mortalities. Um, I won't walk through what all that scenario modeling process looks like uh, just now, um, but we will be developing and exploring those scenarios together in future North of Falcon meetings. Um, and if you're interested, uh, please get involved and attend those. Um, with that, I'll be handing the virtual mic to Dr. Kirsten Simonson, who's our Puget Sound Recreational Salmon Manager. Thanks so much, Derek. I'm going to walk through some of the season recap um, and some of the key areas from last year. Uh, so with that, I'll jump right into it. If we can go to the next slide. So. Uh, the main areas that I'm going to talk about today are marine areas 7, 9, and 11. Um, these are the ones that tend to garner the most questions and the most interest, and so I just wanted to walk through these. Uh, just to kind of orient everyone first, though, um, areas 7 and 9, because of the way that they were, uh, the seasons were run this last year or two, uh, with these kind of short week openers that we've had, um, the data for Chinook fisheries are displayed as a harvest per day. Uh, so it's the number of legal mark Chinook that were caught per day that the fishery was open over that time frame. Um, in contrast, coho and pink fisheries are displayed as uh, CPUE or catch per unit effort. Um, and CPUE is kind of a, a really typical uh, term that we use in fisheries management. And it basically describes the amount of catch per some unit of effort. And in this case, the unit of effort is basically one angler on a trip per day. So it's basically the number of fish caught per angler on any given day that the fishery is open. Um, and I'll show you what this looks like in a, in a second. So uh, for areas 10 and 11, though, because those were more of a, of a full season um, or we tried to make them a full season, um, all that data is displayed as CPUE. So um, if we want to go to the next click forward. So this is kind of what a, a typical CPUE figure looks like here. And just to kind of orient you a little bit to what we're looking at here, you can see that on the x-axis here or the horizontal axis, we have the date. Um, 
that a fishery was open. Um, and then on the Y or the vertical axis, you see the CPUE and you see there's a range of values here and you can kind of see these, these numbers jumping around. Uh, so we want to click forward. So we can see here that this red line represents the current, which is to the 2023 data. Uh, so it's usually the year that we're looking at. So this is the current data for, for CPUE for any given fishery. And then this blue line here is the historic average. And when we say historic average, this is basically the previous five years of this fishery has been open. Um, and for a pink fishery, when we're displaying that, it's just the previous odd years. So just the pink years that, are, that the fishery was um, around. Um, and then you can see that this is kind of a smooth trend and you can kind of see what the red line looks like and you can see that the blue line kind of mirrors that to some degree, uh, looking at this kind of smooth trend there and the uh, the gray shading around that represents um, some of the little bit of the uncertainty in that estimate around that smoothing trend for the, those years. Uh, so if we click forward again, you can see that anytime that that red line is above the blue line, uh, that's basically representing a catch that's kind of above the historical average. And if we click forward again, Anything that's below that line is a, a catch that's typically below average. So that's just to kind of orient you as we're moving through these next couple of slides. This, you're going to see the same type of figure over and over again. So I just wanted to uh, to kind of walk through it slowly for those who are not familiar with seeing these. So uh, we can go to the next slide. And we're here, we're going to start with uh, Chinook catch in area seven. So this is the San Juan Islands. Um, again, I'm showing this by the harvest per day. So you can see the days that the fishery was open here on the x-axis. And you can see that there was really high catch the opening day. Um, and then that catch kind of dropped off to the next weekends that we did have that fishery open. This season was planned for just that one short weekend opener from July 13th through 15th. Um, we took a lot of in-season management um, actions during this, and we were able to, to kind of monitor this very closely and able to open it for um, a couple more days in the following two weekends. So it was open on the 21st and then again the 28th and 29th. Um, at that point, we had pretty much reached our harvest quota and our sublegal encounters limit. Uh, you can see in this table here the fishery controls that existed for this fishery, um, and you could see that we hit 96% of our harvest quota for this fishery and went just over our sublegal encounters, um, 106% uh, for this fishery by the time that it closed down on the 29th. Um, next slide, please. So this is area seven, both the pink and the coho fisheries. Again, this is that CPUE slide that I just kind of walked through. So uh, we could see that for pink fisheries in area seven, uh, we had much higher CPUE than we have seen historically. Uh, this was a pretty great pink year for anybody who was out there able to, to take advantage of that. Uh, we saw really high catches, really high numbers of pinks in, in Puget Sound, kind of throughout Puget Sound for this season. Um, and then you can see uh, the graph on the right shows the coho fishery. And again, you can see above average coho, coho CPUE for this fishery um, in area seven during this year. Uh, that coho fishery was a mark selected fishery during the time that Chinook fishing was open uh, or Chinook retention was open. And then um, it was a mark selected fishery for the month of August. And then that switched to a non selected fishery for the month of September. Um, and another thing to point out is that uh, based on the, the number of pinks that we saw moving into Puget Sound this year, we were able to add two additional pinks um, to that Area 7 fishery beginning on August 19th. So next slide, please. We're going to move into Area 9, which is the Admiralty Inlet area. Um, again, you'll see this, this, this Chinook harvest here displayed as a harvest per day. Um, again, you could see really high numbers for that initial opening weekend and then kind of dropping off after that. Did not drop off quite as precipitously as it did in Area 7, which is kind of consistent with what we saw last year when we had a, a very similar planned fishery. Um, or sorry, in 2022, I keep saying last year as if it's still 23, and it is not. I got to remind myself of that. Um, so this fishery was planned again for uh, that July 13th through 31st for th Thursdays through Saturdays only. Um, the actual season was those two initial uh, three-day openers, and then we were able to get two days out of the that third weekend. Um, did close down one day early on the 29th, and that's because we did reach um, over our harvest quota of 106% that you can see in this table uh, that's here on the bottom. So if we move to the next slide, we'll again and walk through the, the pink and coho fisheries in area nine. Um, again, the pink fishery, you could see that CPUE on the left-hand side, um, as you can see above average catch, above average uh, CPUE for that fishery throughout the, the season. Um, and then for coho, again, you could see this kind of ramped up throughout this as the season went on. Um, and we end up having pretty much above average CPUE for that entire season as well. 
Uh, for coho fisheries, this was marked selective for most of the season while Chinook retention was open and then through uh, the beginning part of September. And it did become non-selective for the end half of September uh, from the 18th through the 30th. And then it closed down after the, the 30th of September as was planned. So if we move to the next slide, we're going to kind of keep walking our way down uh, through Puget Sound. So this is looking at the Chinook catch in area 10, which is the Seattle Bremerton area. Uh, this fishery was uh, planned from August or from July 13th through the end of August. Um, we did kind of have some back and forth with this one. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions on this, which I can definitely answer later on. Uh, the actual season lasted from July 13th through the beginning part of August, closed down. We continued to do uh, test fishing in this area and realized that uh, we had a, a pretty big push of legal marked fish that came in around that same time period. So that dropped our encounter rate. So we were able to open back up again for, for the weekends of August 11th through 13th. And then from August 18th through 20th again, at which point both our harvest quota and our sublegal encounter rate, our limits for this fishery were reached. So the CPUE figure here looks a little bit funky just because you see those drops and that was the time, uh, the time frame that this fishery was closed down um, in those couple weeks of, of August. So next slide, please. So um, I'm going to come back to pink in a second, but this, first I'm going to walk through area 10 uh, coho. So this is the, the figure for coho CPUE in area 10 this summer. And you can see again, um, well, well above average CPUE for this fishery, almost two fish per angler for a little while there. Um, this is an area that is non-selective for coho. Um, it is was open through the end of October. And we did go down to a one coho limit in early August just due to high catch totals for this area. And I will kind of come back to this in a little bit. Uh, we did manage to get back to a two coho limit um, in September uh, based on kind of looking and assessing this fishery as we went on. Um, and you can see kind of where that CPUE spikes back up again is when it went back to two coho in September. So going to the next slide, please. So this is looking at the, the pink fisheries for both area 10 and area 11 now side by side. Uh, they were really similar for this year. We had again, above average CPUE for both of these fisheries. You can see area 10 on the left and area 11 on the right. Um, and we did have traditional pinks added to this uh, quota as of the beginning part of September on September 8th. Um, and so, yeah, again, this was just kind of very typical of this really big run of pinks that we saw in Puget Sound this year. So moving to the next slide. We're now we're going to walk through um, the Area 11 Chinook season. Um, this one is one that I did not put the CPUE figure up. Um, it does it did not make a whole lot of sense based on the kind of short openings that we had for this uh, this fishery this year. Um, but we can kind of walk through some of the numbers. So we did have kind of two separate seasons modeled for this for uh, the period of time for June and then from July basically through when the fishery was was planned through at the end of September. Um, and this is basically due to the difference in the stocks that are uh, modeled for the in this area at, the, at these times. So there is different stock composition based on the modeling that we have and coded wire tag recoveries uh, for the portion of time in June and the portion from July through September. So that's why these are modeled as two separate seasons with two separate quotas. So we could see that the June time frame, um, we did go over our unmarked encounters, which was the wild fish. We did go over that encounter limit um, in early June. So that fishery was um, open from June 1st through 4th and then the 8th through the 11th and then it closed down after June 15th. Um, and then in July, we had a really similar story where we had um, reached our, both of our sublegal encounter and our unmarked or wild encounter limits um, halfway through the fishery as well. So it was open from July 1st to 2nd and then again from the 6th to the 9th the 13th and the 14th, and then again, closed down on July 15th. So this is one that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a little while. Um, I know there'll probably be some questions about this as well. So um, promise I'll get to that. So um, if we want to go to the next slide, please. So this is looking at the area 11 coho fishery now. So we can look at the CPUE plot for this. Again, you can see those areas of above average CPUE for this fishery for the entire season. Um, so the one thing that I do want to point out here is that the preseason modeling for this fishery did not include Chinook non-retention impacts until September. So that's something that's necessary to have if we do anticipate having a fishery that closes to Chinook early, we have non-retention impacts that are built in. For this fishery, we did not have those until September. Um, and and so due to that high impact on wild Chinook, those unmarked Chinook that I showed in the last slide, we were unable to have this fishery open in the marine areas uh, during that planned pink and coho fishery time period in August. 
Um, and for that reason, we just decided to go to a shore-based only, knowing that there's very few Chinook impacts when we have a shore-based only fishery. And then once we had those non-retention impacts back into the fishery, uh, we reopened the, the marine area on the 1st of September. Um, this is an area where coho is non-selective uh, for this fishery. And again, it was open then from uh, when it reopened in the marine area on the 1st of September, it was open through the end of October. So we wanna go to the next slide. So I got, like I said, I wanted to talk through some of these, uh, uh, the coho in-season management actions that were taken this year. Usually coho is not a, a fishery that we intensively manage in season um, and have fishery controls on just because co uh, coho are not ESA listed like Chinook are. Um, so for that reason, we typically don't take a whole lot of in-season management action on them. However, that's not to say that we don't have to be accountable for the numbers of coho that we are catching in these fisheries. So here, I wanted to show a couple of things here. So this is some estimates of the July catches for uh, three different fisheries. So we have area nine, area 10, and area 11, all in July. And you could see the numbers that we're looking at here were the preseason predicted numbers for both retained and total encounters. Um, in area nine, what was pre what was the preseason prediction of catch and the actual estimate was uh, over 350% of the retained and over 260% of the total encounters. Uh, for area 10, that number was over 260% of the retained and over 175% of the total encounters. And area 11 was again over 170% of the retained fish and then over 100% of the total encounters. So one of the questions that we've gotten as the season went on was why were there actions that were taken in area 10 uh, and not in other areas? And so there's really two reasons for this. One of them is just the magnitude of the catch that we saw in area 10. Uh, you can see that, yes, it was not, the percentage was not as high as say area nine, but just the sheer number of fish that were caught in this area, it was over 12,000 fish, which was over 8,000 more fish than we anticipated seeing in this fishery. Um, and so that was one of the reasons. The other reason that in-season management actions were taken in this fishery was that there was uh, concerns over certain coho stocks um, of concern that were limiting for the fisheries this year. And some of those stocks are found in high numbers based on our modeling of coho wire tag returns in this area. So based on just the sheer number of fish that were caught and the stocks of concern that we were potentially impacting, uh, we made the decision to go down to that one coho limit. And then once we kind of stabilized, we went, we were able to bump it back up to two fish uh, limit, two coho limit in this area. So, um, and then we want to go to the next slide. So this is a, you know, a kind of a story of, of looking at coho-directed fisheries and Chinook, Chinook impacts during these fisheries. So the other thing that I, I want to point out with some of these is that you know it's so important for us to be accounting for catch and release impacts of Chinook during these pink and coho-directed fisheries. Um, so additional intensive monitoring has been implemented since 2020 because of this. So during these coho fisheries, we are doing intensive monitoring to assess any potential Chinook impacts. And this is because any salmon directed fishery that we have has the potential to impact our conservation goals on some of these key stocks. So um, that's just kind of a brief overview of what we had going on this past season. Um, and with that, I'm going to kind of move it looking forward. So if we want to go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Baltel, who is our salmon statewide salmon and steelhead manager, and we're going to kind of walk through some of the the things we're expecting um, looking forward in the next season. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I realize we've been talking for almost an hour now, and it's a lot of information to digest. Um, I am the last formal speaker this evening, so I'll, I'll try to keep my comments brief and, and on target. I'm gonna talk a little bit here uh, about uh, kind of the outlook for 2024. Um, talk through uh, a little bit about in-season management and the list of agreed fisheries. I'm gonna um, talk through some of our recent year recreational priorities uh, that, uh, that we've considered as we've implemented seasons this year. I'm going to touch on some um, some trends that we've been seeing in the data uh, with regards to uh, recreational fisheries, uh, particularly directed at Chinook. Uh, and then I'm going to just uh, do some some high level talking about some of the trends in the data and uh, some of the other challenges that we have for uh, implementing recreational fisheries. So next slide, Ailey. So. Uh, 
folks who are are new to the the process and and thinking ahead um really uh it's really hard for us to to say we really know what to expect uh until we get the forecasts for the the upcoming year so uh as has been mentioned previously in this discussion uh those are being worked on currently we expect to finalize the finalize those with our co-managers uh, here by the uh, middle of February and have those out during our forecast presentation uh, early in March. Um, I think it's fair to say that as we're looking at the landscape, still Guamish Chinook will continue to uh, restrict marine area fishing opportunities as they have been in uh, the most recent, you know, five to six year period. Uh, as Kirsten mentioned uh, and others, it's an even year. So uh, no pink salmon as part of our salmon uh, planning this year. And really just, you know, I think folks should expect that uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, approach these fisheries um, uh, with the same kind of level of uh, uh, consideration that we have in the past. Uh, we have a recently adopted uh, North of Falcon policy that has gone through the commission process that really uh, guides, uh, provides a guide for us, an additional guide besides all of our uh, conservation and recovery goals. Uh, that, that policy helps guide us in, re in regards to fishing opportunities and how we just try to provide a diverse and, and balanced suite of those fisheries. Next slide, please. So uh, Kyle talked about it a little earlier. Um, we have this document that we produce at the end of North of Falcon called the List of Agreed Fisheries. It's really a, a, a big document that, that talks through all of the planned fishery dates uh, and seasons for both the, the tribal co-managers and the state fisheries uh, from the coast and in Puget Sound and in all the freshwater systems. Um, within that uh, document, there's, there's uh, a lot of um, appendices that are in there, uh, some uh, in-season management, test fishing uh, plans, uh, other agreed to monitoring plans for the state. Um, you'll often find uh, our uh, fishery controls in there that we developed through the North of Falcon process. So I wanted to make sure folks were aware that that document exists. Uh, it is available for public consumption approximately seven to 10 days after we finalize our preseason fisheries at, after the uh, second Pacific, Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting in early April. Um, another thing, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, occasions where uh, fisheries that are planned in the loaf, uh, that uh, there are deviations from those planned fisheries. Um, often that comes uh, with kind of either preseason or in season agreements. Uh, based on in-season update tools, um, and and just for folks' awareness, we you know we do communicate throughout the fishing year uh, and uh, the non-fishing parts of the year with our co-managers, uh, collaborating on all aspects of of these fishery management plans and uh, the evaluation of these fisheries. Next slide, please. So since 2018. Uh, we have seen some big changes uh, in our marine area fisheries, particularly char targeting Chinook. Uh, we updated our uh, the FRAM model that Derek talked about earlier with an updated base period of years uh, uh, with those coded wire tags. And um, through that modeling and subsequent agreement on management objectives, um, we we noticed that uh, the landscape was a little different than how we had been looking at it in the past. And I think uh, one uh, aspect of this that I wanted to get across is that not all these marine areas are the same uh, in terms of impact on stocks of concern. Um, some areas like Area 7 have really high uh, mortalities in the model on still Aguamish. So in both the winter time period and the summer time period, those are really expensive fisheries in terms of uh, impacts on still Aguamish, our most limiting stock. So uh, that is something that we take into consideration when we're trying to uh, plan these fisheries in the preseason. 
also, as we've uh, uh, struggled or you know had to shape these fisheries to meet these updated management objectives, um, and we we knew that we had to make some tough choices on fishing opportunities. Uh, we heard from our angling public and through uh, a number of North of Falcon processes uh, that uh, folks favored summer fishing opportunities uh, directed at returning adults as opposed to winter fisheries uh, targeting blackmouth. Um, as I said, uh, there are a number of uh, winter fisheries areas, traditional winter fisheries areas that were closed uh, because of the uh, uh, lessened uh, amount of impacts available to prosecute fisheries. Um, I think we talked about this also that, uh, you know, in pink and coho seasons, there are uh, non-retention uh, release mortalities that are associated with those opportunities as well. Uh, we've actually, the department has uh, increased those monitoring efforts um, in those time periods and seasons to make sure that we're being fully accountable in our fisheries for those uh, non-target mortalities. And again, I talked about this earlier, but really uh, we've worked hard uh, to balance these opportunities, to maximize catch when we can, to maximize fishing time on the water when we can, also provide for fresh har freshwater harvests, and really do it across a, a broad geographic area of, of the coast and Western Washington and try to do that within our conservation limitations. Next slide, please. So what we have displayed here is uh, taking the numbers that uh, Derek and his team produce uh, from the model, and we're looking at total Puget Sound recreational sport catch from 2014 to 2023. So I think the big takeaway that we wanted to present with this slide is if, if we're looking over a long period of time, the recreational catch in Puget Sound has remained relatively stable. Um, you see that, uh, that spike there in uh, around 2017 and 2018. And if you look at the table to the right-hand side of the slide, um, you'll see that that's South Puget Sound terminal run size. And really uh, that table there is just meant to inform a, a big contributing factor to that sport catch in 2017 and 2018. You'll also see that same uh, uh, spike in catch as we progress through uh, the next couple of slides. But I do think it's important to note that in 2017, that South Sound hatchery run size was the second highest return since 1975. So I, uh, I think it's worth noting that, um, you know, those, those fish are caught all through all of our fisheries. Next slide, please. So again, uh, taking that previous slide as overall Puget Sound sport catch, and we're breaking that down now into smaller chunks by marine area. So on the left-hand side, you're going to see the Straits and San Juan Islands. So that's marine areas five in blue, six in red, and seven in green. Um, and on the right-hand side, you're gonna see marine areas eight uh, in blue, nine in red, and 12 in green. So back to the left-hand slide, I think, uh, you know, it obviously shows the big reductions that we've taken to the area seven opportunities in the recent years maybe a, a small uptick in area six and maybe a small downturn in area five. On the right-hand side, I think uh, we would say, you know, those area 12 catches are relatively stable and area nine and eight have uh, seen some reductions due to constraining stocks. Next slide. And finally, mid and south sound with area 10 uh, being in blue, area 11 uh, being in orange and area 13 uh, in gray. Uh, you can see those uh, elevated catches in 10 and 11 in that 17, 18 time period. Um, but really, uh, uh, you know, we've seen some increases in catch in both 10 and 13. So I think the, the take home message there is that we've, uh, We've, we've seen stable catches and, and kind of the, the notion that those uh, uh, were getting less fish kind of towards the recreational fishery 
uh, is discounted a little bit as far as the preseason modeling. What we're really seeing is a, a, a redistribution of those catches from uh, the past to kind of more recent. Uh, next slide, please. So previously we were looking at preseason uh, catches from the model. This slide shows us uh, postseason marine sport catches. And on the graph, the solid line indicates the, the, a combined summer and winter Chinook sport catch in Puget Sound. And the dotted line represents the, the Puget Sound uh, summer fall Chinook return. Um, the the preseason catches that we talked about are really important for the planning piece of, of what we do each year. Um, these postseason catches are the actual estimated catches from each fishing season. And I think uh, what we were just trying to show here is that it's pretty clear that our recreational catches are following uh, the, the fall, uh, summer fall run size in each of these years um, pretty closely. Next slide, please. So a couple slides here to wrap up. And I think uh, this has been uh, demonstrated by Derek a little while ago, but I think we wanted to just talk through a little bit more some of the challenges uh, that we're seeing in the data and the trends within these fisheries. So what you're seeing on the screen here is four different marine areas, uh, seven in red, nine in green, uh, 10 in the uh, teal blue color, and then 11 in the, the purple violet color. Um, and really what we want to represent to you is, is the increasing catch per day uh, in each of these areas that we're seeing in most recent years trends. Next slide, please. And really just talking through some of that, I think uh, we have seen these uh, elevated trends um, uh, of increasing effort and catchability in a lot of our marine areas. Um, it's also pretty apparent to us that uh, as we've moved forward in time from you know, the, the 20 teens till now, uh, we have a, a, a pretty uh, socially tuned in, social media tuned in fishing fleet. Uh, there's a, a lot of information that gets passed uh, back and forth freely uh, through all sorts of different social media platforms. And we know that uh, our recreational fleet is increasingly mobile and we're, we'll go where the opportunities exist, uh, when they exist, and when the bite is on, uh, they will go and uh, try to get their opportunity before it closes. Uh, we know that as these opportunities decrease over time, that's gonna concentrate this effort uh, and it causes the harvest and counter levels uh, that we have to abide by for the conservation and recovery goals, it, it causes those to be met sooner than we plan in those preseason processes. And that's where the in-season management comes in. The irregularity in a lot of the recent year trends uh, makes uh, predictability uh, and uncertainty uh, in what we're trying to do in any given year that much harder. Um, I, I can't get out of here with uh, kind of touching on some of the things that Dr. Litz talked about. Uh, climate change is going to continue uh, and we're going to have to make sure that we're uh, uh, capturing the effects of climate change in our decision-making processes, uh, not just on, on salmon, but the other species that are adjacent to salmon. And I think really the biggest take home message here for everybody is uh, as frustrating as fisheries closures and restrictive management is, uh, these are listed populations. Uh, they have been listed since 1999 and we are not uh, making meaningful recovery. Uh, I, uh, fisheries will continue to be limited uh, until we start to see improvement in these areas. So with that, I think we're gonna bring a slide up to go through uh, what's ahead here for our, our North of Falcon planning process. Uh, not sure if I'm supposed to walk through it on here, but I'm happy to. Uh, upcoming, we talked about uh, in uh, the end of February, we'll start off with a Willapaw Grace Harbor salmon forecast meeting. Um, that's a virtual meeting. On Friday, March 1st, we're gonna have our forecast kickoff 
That's going to be a hybrid meeting. We're going to do that from uh, OB building across from the Natural Resources Building in Olympia. Uh, times to be determined, but it'll probably be 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. The first Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting will be in Fresno this year uh, for those interested. Uh, that'll be in early March, and that's where we set ocean salmon uh, all, uh, fishing alternatives for Chinook and Coho. Uh, our first uh, public North of Falcon meeting will be Wednesday, March 13th, again, back at the OB2 building across from the Natural Resources Building in Olympia. It will be a hybrid meeting as well. We'll have a, a, a first uh, recreational fisheries discussion uh, with a Zoom meeting on Tuesday, March 19th. Uh, we'll have those uh, ocean uh, fishing levels and be able to start center in on uh, what, the, what the constraints to our fishing opportunities are for Puget Sound this year. Um, on March 21st, there'll be a, a public meeting around Columbia River Fisheries. Um, that will be a hybrid meeting as well and in person at the Ridgefield office. Uh, again, a uh, second meeting in the same week for recreational fisheries, another Zoom meeting on Thursday, March 21st in the evening. Uh, Wednesday, March 27th, the next week, we'll have another uh, North of Falcon 2 meeting. This will be in Linwood, Washington at the Linwood Embassy Suites. Uh, we will host that meeting. It will also be a hybrid meeting. Uh, and uh, again, we will talk about fishery alternatives uh, and uh, planning for the upcoming season. March 28th will bring us to the Willapa and Grace Harbor Fisheries meeting. Uh, the second and final Pacific Fisheries Management Council meeting will be in Seattle uh, this year at the Westin from April 6th to the 11th. And then we'll have a, uh, a final proposed fisheries for Willapa and Grace Harbor shortly following the uh, PFMC meeting on April 16th, which is a Tuesday. All this information is available on our website. Uh, uh, and we will have any additional meeting and uh, uh, preseason info available there uh, as you make your way through the preseason process. Uh, again, thanks everybody for being here tonight. And I think I'm gonna hand it back to Nate to head over to the Q&A portion of our evening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mark. And thanks to all the presenters. I really appreciate the, the work that goes into uh, compiling those PowerPoints and taking the time to present this information. So um, I think we're, we're gonna jump to the q and I don't know if we have a, a slide again on just the, the Zoom mechanics, Leah, or, or if we wanna just go straight into um, the questions here. Leah, thoughts? Yeah. I am not sure if there is another slide in the presentation, but I can give a verbal reminder for folks uh, to raise your hand. Um, it's going to be star nine if you're on your phone. Um, if you're in person, there is a raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it looks like a smiley face that says reactions, depending on the Zoom um, that you are using. Um, and also there is... I will go through and unmute you, but if you're on the phone, you may need to hit star six on your phone. Our first hand is from Gabe. Gabe, go ahead. It, it, and Leah, just one other item. If we could uh, take the PowerPoint down now and uh, and we'll go to Gabe's question. Thanks. Go ahead, Gabe. Got it. Uh, you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, thanks. Um, what factors or metrics does the department use to inform their decision to use uh, all the various fishery controls in each area of Puget Sound? I guess maybe I'll take that one and uh, team, if I miss something or you need to add something, jump in. Um, I really think, uh, Great question, Gabe. Um, I don't think that we have a specific set of metrics that we use. Uh, I think we uh, take a look at the big picture um, as we're going through the preseason process, thinking about the constraining stocks and, and you know, looking at the different marine areas and thinking about the level of risk uh, that comes with exceeding any one of those metrics. Um, also, you know, sometimes uh, we put things in place 
uh, because that's what it takes to get to uh, agreement with our co-managers. Um, so although there may not be definitive biological reasons why we put fishery controls in place, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a necessary uh, thing that we need to do to bring a level of comfort uh, to our co-managers about our fisheries impacts in any one of our fishery. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, it does. Um, what, uh, can you speak to what specific stock we were concerned about last June in Area 11, why we had an unmarked encounter fishery control there? I don't know that I can speak to that specifically right now. Uh, I would I would want to go back, but I think in general, Gabe, as we're thinking about all this suite of fisheries, uh, it goes back to that uh, stilly payback provision that Kyle talked about earlier. Um, I don't think that we want to be sitting here in a future town hall talking to you about how we're going to have uh, little to no salmon fishing opportunity because we significantly exceeded a management objective that caused us to reduce our impact on Stiligwamish fish. I think that's uh, the, the sort of Damocles that hangs over our head at any one given time. And uh, I guess we're, we're taking a precautionary pro approach, knowing the status of these stocks and knowing that uh, the risks are great uh, if we uh, significantly exceed any one of these management objectives. Okay, I understood. I want to push back a little bit, though. The Stiligwamish, the June fishery in Area 11 has one of the lowest impacts on Stiligwamish stock in Puget Sound, and it's it's an important fishery at a time of year where there aren't many other fisheries open. And when looking through, you know, AEQ charts and management objectives, it it I'm struggling to understand why there's an unmarked encounter fishery control in that fishery when, you know, it's one of the least impactful on Stiligwamish. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say anything new to you, Gabe. Uh, again, I think I was pretty clear that uh, sometimes these are uh, about reaching an agreement. And although they may or may not make sense, uh, we're, we're sticking to our agreements and we're going to manage to the levels that we agreed to manage to. Understood. Loud and clear. Thank you. Hey, hey thanks. Thanks, Gabe. Just just a, a, a note. We, we had a suggestion from one of our Puget Sound advisors that, that I, I really appreciate. And Leah, I am ask you is, you know, we want to try to take hands in order that they come up. And I know that we're getting some questions in the chat as well. So we'll probably bounce back and forth. But I do know that there's an advisory group meeting coming up here later this week. And so we might be able to have more time with advisors and, and look to see if there's some 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 names and uh, that we haven't heard from recently to really take advantage of the staff that we have assembled here and get some of the, uh, some some questions answered that way as well. And as we work through the queue, maybe we'll have time to get to some more questions from advisors. So if that makes sense for folks, I hope that's what we can do. And I'll turn it back to Leah. Thank you. That sounds great. And uh, first person from the chat is going to be Patrick. Patrick, go ahead and ask your questions live. It looks like you're unmuted, Patrick. We can't hear you if you're talking. Okay, Patrick, we can we see your questions in the chat and we can respond to you afterwards. They are all recorded. Our next hand is from Colby. Colby, go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, I have a couple questions. I represent basically, uh, I fish 10, 11, and 13 as far as marine areas. And my biggest questions are, I was uh, at the sportsman show last year and I saw a gear restriction and that was pretty plain in day uh, results from your test fishery boats on gear sizes and gear restriction. I know we already have barbless uh, hooks in requirement and a maximum of two hooks. I would love to see more gear restrictions in place. I was out fishing today in 13, fishing big lures, big hooks, and I did not hook up to one sublegal Chinook. And then as far as that goes, as far as size restrictions, which is another question that I have, I would love to see a maximum. Um, there's no point in keeping a fish 
in my opinion, over 20 pounds in the Puget Sound. They are very hard to come by. And those are the fish that we want to protect. There's very few fish, but they are being caught in uh, native nets out there that are still in the Puget Sound. There are 40 plus pound Chinook in the Puget Sound. Like I said, they're very hard to come by, but they are out there. And then my last question is, we have these hatchery only fisheries, which are marked select. I would love to see those go throughout the whole season. Why open it up to wild fish when we have these ESA selective fisheries that are obviously endangerment to not only local waters, but the nation. Um, I would just love to see that just carry out through the Puget Sound. It sucks that we would have to close the season earlier because of these wild fish that we need to protect, but that's why they are protected is to protect them. So those are my three questions. I know it's a lot really fast, but those are just my three topics that I'd love to cover for my fellow anglers in the Puget Sound. Thank you. So I think I'll jump in first if everyone's okay with that, Colby, on the gear study, because that was my study. You probably saw me <laughs> speak to that at the Sportsman Show last year. Um, so that study is ongoing, and we are, uh, we, I have now another full year of data, so it'll make three full years of data that I have for on the study, um, looking at the test fishing data that we've been collecting. Um, so I do plan on... Uh, having kind of an update to that, um, probably during North of Falcon 2 this year to kind of give more of an update. At this point in time, we did see some differences uh, with those gear types in different areas. It was very season um, and area specific. There's pretty significant spatial and temporal trends. So kind of having a blanket Puget Sound rule um, is not necessarily the way to go on this, um, at least from the data we've seen so far. Um, again, there's some some of those areas had had kind of smaller sample sizes than others, um, which is why we're kind of continuing this on. I think we'll always continue to collect this gear data as, as we're doing test fisheries. Um, but in the meantime, you know, there's there's no rule again that says you have to use a small gear. If you people, folks are going out and, and using larger gear, that's great. And I love to hear about that. I love to hear that people are doing that and seeing what they're catching. Um, so in the meantime, you know, we do recommend to folks, especially in some of those winter fisheries when we know we have smaller fish in the area yeah use bigger gear um the data does show that there is some effect um it's not necessarily what i would say actionable right now we're not going to actually go out there and make a law about it um it would be really difficult to enforce number one and number two again we're still collecting that data just to see where that gets us uh so that's what i can say about the gear study but it's great to hear that you know you have been kind of partaking in it on your own and seeing what you got there um, I think the second part of your question was about um, the, hold on, remind me what the second part of your question was. Um, sorry, I I don't want to jump too far, far forward with the second part of the question, which was size restriction, limiting it to a maximum. Um, but as far as gear restrictions, we have barbless hooks are required. I have not been checked by one law enforcement agent in the past five years as far as fishing in the Puget Sound, and I'm an avid angler in the Puget Sound as far as using barbless hooks. I have actually been contacted more by the Coast Guard than I have a game warden as far as what I'm using. So the fact that you can't implement it and set it as a gear restriction is, I don't mean to be too straightforward with it, but it's its kind of, it hurts to hear that, honestly, because we already have gear restrictions implemented already. So I'm not saying that we can't do it. <laughs> I'm gonna let Mark. I saw saw Mark getting ready to jump in, so I'm gonna let him speak to it as well. Uh, uh, Kirsten was headed down the right road, Kobe. Uh, it's not that we can't do it. I think uh, from our perspective, uh, we need to understand the implications of uh, a rule change like that. Um, you know, remember there's there's lots of uh, fishing shops around Puget Sound that have already bought gear for the upcoming year. And if we made a significant gear change uh, without some significant public outreach and, and at least uh, some more data to support any decision that we may land on, um, uh, I think we would, uh, plus, you know, uh, having conversations with our co-managers before we would implement anything like that, uh, I think are all things that we would want to check the box before we would go down the road of doing uh, large marine area uh, gear changes uh, for the upcoming year. I appreciate that answer, and I'm I'm sorry to to push back again, but it's it's really hard because barbless hooks are not a size restriction. Um, you can have all the way down to as small as a hook as you want with a barb on it, 
or without a barb on it. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But you can have down to as small as a hook as you want with a barbless hook, and it's still legal in all marine waters. But you do have, I believe, a size restriction up to a three quarter or seven eighths hook gap. As long as it's barbless, it's legal. So that that's kind of it's it's uh, a really tough question to ask, but it should be asked because there's also rivers in the Puget Sound and other parts of Washington where bait is restricted. That's another gear restriction that it's, it's like I said, I don't mean to be a devil's advocate, but I'm, I, it's a question that has to be asked because gear restriction as of my hard data and as of your guys' hard data in the Puget Sound area 10 uh, size restriction on your lures, bigger lures produce bigger fish. It's plain a day. <clears throat> Thanks, Colby. I think there was one other aspect, I think, in the question here, and then we'll, let's move to uh, uh, another yeah. uh, person. But, Colby, you had asked, I believe it was, you know, wh why don't we have a restriction uh, that would require folks to release fish uh, above a certain size? And so, uh, Mark, can you can you speak to that? Uh, we've uh, considered uh, different size uh, restrictions within different marine areas over time. Um, in the recent past, there has been uh, proposals from the angling public to uh, basically raise the minimum size limit specifically for Area 7 um, to, to help uh, reduce the uh, impacts on uh, 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 particularly still Aguamish stock in that area. Um, it's, it's complicated as we start adjusting sizes for uh, different marine areas or consider uh, different size limits. Um, in, in my uh, 20 plus year career, uh, I don't remember us uh, implementing a slot limit for salmon in a, in a marine area fishery where we would have uh, an upper bound. Um, I certainly th think it's, uh, you know, if, if it were a proposal, uh, we could evaluate it and, and consider that as part of the North mm -hmm. Falcon process this year. Um, but, uh, and I don't know if any of my teammates have any other knowledge or um, history that they want to bring to the table here, but but that's my recollection on on that uh, that issue. I might just add, Mark. Um, historically, it was a little different. Now, all of our Puget Sound Chinook fisheries are mark selective. So, if we had a maximum size limit, we'd be telling someone, "You just caught a big hatchery fish, and now you have to let it go." In the case of Chinook, so that's an argument we would hear against enacting a maximum Chinook size limit in Puget Sound. All right. Well, thanks, Colby. Uh, Leah, do you want to uh, highlight yep. the next? Great. Yeah, our next question in the chat is from Randy. Randy, go ahead. Randy, I have prompted you to unmute. Okay, so, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I, I just have a, a couple of questions. Actually, a question and then a, a comment. So I'm up here in Whatcom, Skagit County, and we have Whatcom Creek that there were several thousand Chinook, and we were all complaining there's not enough Chinook salmon. There's several thousand Chinook that weren't allowed to spawn. Basically, they wouldn't let water out. There's, you know, the state or the city wouldn't let water out to let them go up and spawn naturally. So they just let them get netted. And then you have the Samish hatchery that I live really close to. There are holding ponds. I went back and forth there for a couple of weeks. We let thousands, probably five to 10,000 fish just die below those bladder dams they have. Why not let those go up and spawn? I mean, the Billingham Bay fishery that is open for those Samish fish is an either or, marked or unmarked fishery. Why not let them go up and spawn and you put more fish in the water? I mean, that's just two rivers in a small area. I'm sure there's other places where the same thing has happened. We, we let fish just die, and at least I'm giving them a chance to go up and spawn. And my question is on the Stillaguamish, why don't we just tell them to stop clipping their fish, wire tag them? If they would stop clipping those fish, there'd be less of an impact because nowhere in Washington can you keep an unmarked fish. Now, they say they won't be able to tell where the fish are being caught. They should have more returning because they shouldn't be kept anyway. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to clip the fish and then 
put a limit on the fish can be caught. Just don't clip them, wire tag them. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense when you clip them because then people can keep them. So but that's it. I so the, the really big one is why we let why we wasted probably ten to fifteen thousand Chinook in just two small river systems, a creek and a river. Why we let them go to waste. So I'll uh, I'll try to take that uh, first part, uh, Randy, and then I think Derek is going to hop on for the the second piece of your question. Um, the, the two systems that you talked about, uh, the Chinook salmon raised, uh, they're both from hatcheries. So the Whatcom Creek hatchery has a really small program. It's a, it's a demonstration program that uh, is a cooperative event, uh, uh, endeavor with the, the Lummi Nation and um, the, the department. And I believe it is run with the Bellingham Technical College staff uh, as part it of is. that curriculum for that program. So those fish are either intended for harvest or returned to the hatchery for brood stock. Uh, if they're not harvested before they get to the Whatcom Creek, uh, then you know they're not really uh, suitable for fisheries. And I know there's been a lot of uh, enforcement and other challenges around that Whatcom Creek zone uh, since we started that, that project. Uh, same thing with the Samish hatchery. Uh, we have quite a robust uh, Chinook salmon program out of the Samish. Um, we do not want all those hatchery fish to go above the hatchery rack and spawn. Uh, that would not be appropriate. So, uh, you know, uh, I know we've had some pretty significant returns to the Samish in, in recent years, and I, I believe there's some uh, current infrastructure improvements underway to try to help us deal with uh, some of that uh, return and, uh, and uh, increased harvest levels as we've increased that production to help uh, feed Southern resident killer whales. So, so why, gonna... why wouldn't you let those Sandwich River fish go up? I mean, what's the reasoning behind it? Other than they're, they came out of a hatchery, they would still be fish. I mean, and that's our goal is to increase the number of fish, if I'm hearing correctly. More fish equals more opportunity and more food for everybody out there. Uh, I, I don't think more fish equals more opportunity when we're limited by uh, uh, natural stocks uh, in really low abundances. Uh, you know, the, the problem isn't the amount of hatchery fish to harvest. It's the amount of wild fish available that we impact and kill while we're trying to get to hatchery fish. We'll have to agree to disagree on that. <laughs> So what thanks, about thanks, the Stiligwamish? Thanks, yeah, let's let's move on them. to the, the question about uh, Stiligwamish uh, Chinook and, 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 and the, the marking aspect. Derek, can you cover that? Yeah, thanks, Nate. And that was a great question, Randy. So for the Stiligwamish, um, the Stiligwamish is, of course, a stock that we manage domestically. We also have international um, management obligations on the Stiligwamish, Stiligwamish of the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And through those international obligations, uh, we need to um, have coded wire tag returns to evaluate to ensure compliance uh, with our um, treaty with Canada, the Pacific Salmon Treaty. Um, as a part of that, the reason why they have to be marked uh, for those coded wire tag releases is because um, a lot of fisheries along the West Coast are only designed to sample uh, marked fish, uh, for example, many of the Canadian fisheries and many of the Alaskan fisheries, and then even in some of our own recreational fisheries where it's mark selective, we wouldn't get coded wire tag recoveries and it would be hard to evaluate the impacts on, on Stiligwamish if, if all those fish were unmarked and coded wire tag rather than marked and coded wire tagged. So it's kind of an evaluation purpose as to why we need to be marking and tagging those fish. Okay, our next hand is from Scott. Scott, go ahead. Okay, um, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. I mainly fish in area 11, some in 13. Um, I want to I want to just be very honest with you guys. I'm I'm very frustrated. Um I have I have fished out here for over 50 years. And to see 11 managed the way it is is just very frustrating. Um we missed out 
I believe we missed out on pretty much all of the Pialp run and the Nisqually run got, getting shut down by July 15th. And I believe the encounters, you know, all these, in, in you know, these um, sublegal encounters and all of that, I think are very low numbers. Area 11 is very far away from the Stillaguamish River. So I don't think the impacts are very high. And then we get very low numbers to begin with, much lower than areas nine and 10. So then by August, from Port Townsend all the way down to the Narrows Bridge, close for Chinook. Absolutely unacceptable. And I have seen time after time, and I know this is before your guys' time, but I sure fished the, the bottom fishery out here back in the 80s. Those are all gone. Mismanagement. You guys let the draggers in. I um I sent in to Mark and you know a an email just saying a lot of this stuff. And all I got back was kind of a form letter. Um I also sent it to Jim Gorg of the Real News. He printed it in the September issue. And he printed the form letter that you guys sent in the October issue. So if you guys want to review it, go right ahead. It's in those issues. But I mean, I have never been so ticked off and frustrated in my entire life with this fishing. I've I started fishing when I was five and a half in a pond. I grew up out here. I caught my first legal fish in Puget Sound over 50 years ago. And this is just it's appalling. And yeah, you can spend, you know, spend five dollars a gallon running into the ocean, chasing down one or two fish here and there. It just, there's guys in the boat lockers down here at Point Defiance. Some of them don't even have trailers for their boats. So it's Area 11, maybe Area 10 if they run a bunch of gas up, or Area 13 and run a bunch of gas to go down there. Area 11 is just really getting the shaft here. And it is just, I don't know. I mean, maybe it'd be better to open... 11, a little bit later, that would be the Puget Sound Committee that could maybe do that when the Puyallup run maybe shows up a little bit more. But it's really disheartening to have it open the 1st of July, and it's twos and fews out there, and then all of a sudden the, fifth, the 15th shows up. Oh, you've taken, you've gotten all the encounters. We left about four or 5,000 fish on the table. Wonder what happened to those fish. I'll bet you the hatcheries had so many surplus, and that you know the the buyers of the cat food and the fertilizer industry got overloaded. What happened to all those excess fish that we should have caught? We should have been able to catch. We buy those fish with our licenses. We pay for all this, and it all that we're we're denied even access them. It's just absolutely disheartening. And then I send you guys an email and I just kind of get back some form letter that is just, it's just, you know, just whatever. It's, hey, it, hey, there's got to be a way to re remanage this thing than this. Thanks, Scott. You know, uh, there, there was a lot in there and understand the, the, the first level of frustration that you shared. Um, Dr. Simonson, can I ask you, I, I, I'm not going to ask you to call up the PowerPoint again, but could you just provide just a quick sketch again of what was the main takeaways as far as what happened uh, for Marine Area 11 in particular, just, just in case Scott missed that that part. I, I just think that's an important point to, 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 to take another lap around the track, please. Thanks. Yeah, just really briefly, that fishery was closed down due to two different things. It was sublegal encounters um, and it was unmarked encounters. So those were the two big ones. So the June fishery was primarily unmarked encounters and the July fishery was both sublegal and unmarked encounters. And I know that there's been talk about um, the unmarked fish that are in Area 11 um, and how far away it is from Stilly, but I want to just take the second to remind everybody um, that all Puget Sound Chinook are ESA listed. So even though it's not necessarily a lot of still, still Guamish impacts in that area, it does not mean that there's not 
all other ESA listed stocks that are impacted. So um, I just wanted to kind of refresh that. And I see that Derek just turned on his camera. So I'll pause and see if he has anything to add. Yeah. Um, so you're right, Kirsten, that it isn't only still a Guamish. And particularly when we're looking at Area 11, when we were in the preseason planning process last year, we were looking at Nisqually and we were looking at balancing kind of uh, where, um, since we were over on our Nisqually impacts as we were leading up to the final model runs, we were looking at how we would balance opportunities in different areas. And the Nisqually River did have kind of quite a reduced season this this last year. So, um, so as Kirsten mentioned, there are kind of multiple factors that go into some of these decisions that we make, and and Nisqually was uh, a stock that was really of concern as we looked at Area Eleven. Thanks, everyone. Our next question is from Dave. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, guys. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um. I want to switch gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about the impact of um, protected runs, the impact of endangered runs. What we haven't talked about is conflicts where co-management really sparked the closure, right? And I wanted to talk about specifically the Skokomish River. Um, for, for years, me and my family and friends have fished that river and, and created bonds and friendships and, you know, to have it taken away because of, of um, conflict between um tribe and 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 co-managers is uh you know incredibly frustrating and i just uh oh it looks like we lost him i think he must have dropped the call uh let's go to the next hand it is jeff jeff go ahead yeah i just wanted to thank you guys for uh can you hear me I wanted to thank you all for very, very good, clear, clean presentations. Um, I had a question about uh, the whether the size of Chinook in the summer fisheries has changed, especially on those kind of high catch days on the first day something opens since blackmouth fishing has been closed in six and seven and nine for a few years now. Are, are people just catching a lot of six to ten pound Chinook and and filling up our summer fishery with those fish. So I'm gonna jump in real quick. Jeff, is there an, a marine area that you're particularly looking at or just in general? Uh nine, seven. Okay. So I don't have that data right in front of me, but if you send me a quick email, I can pull that data and get something over to you to share um, and we can you know add it to the material that comes with this presentation as well that'll be up on the website um, I just I don't have the specific size length data in front of me and I, I don't want to like take up a whole bunch of time trying to dig around for it so just shoot me a quick email um, and I'll make sure I get that out to you I'll do that can I take one more quick one while I while I'm here yep one of the things Mark mentioned on his slides was trying to increase time on the water I'm wondering whether you've considered uh, some sort of a limited entry approach for these summer fisheries, uh, even numbered wild IDs, odd numbered wild IDs or something. I know I participate in area nine and I catch my fish, but I'm usually pissed off by the time I get home. So, I mean, the, the crowds are just insane and you're seeing it in your catch data. So is, is there a way to, limit entry in a way that's that's fair and equitable that um, will increase the quality of the experience for the people who are fishing. Thanks. I'll try to take a stab at that one. And thanks for the, the question, Jeff. I, um, we've, uh, I, I can't say that we haven't bantered that around, uh, you know, we constantly try to think of, of new and different ideas uh, you know, and we have obviously the hunting side of our house that does, uh, you know, uh, tag draws and, and different things like that uh, to allow for some opportunity. I think when it comes to managing large marine area fisheries, uh, it, it really becomes more of an enforcement issue. Um, we, I don't think that we have enough enforcement staff uh, to be able to uh, monitor a large marine area like uh, Marine Area 9 uh, and, and check everybody's uh, licenses to make sure that 
uh, it's your day to be out there fishing Marine Area 9 for Chinook. Um, I, I think it's a, a novel idea and, you know, I, um, I wouldn't be opposed to exploring new and different ways for providing opportunities like that. Um, I think we're just challenged uh, under the current framework of, of how we do business to try to implement something like that. But I totally appreciate kind of the out of the box thinking and, and just rest assured that, uh, you know, we do think about things like that too. So I just want to do just a, a quick uh, process uh, check before we go to the next question. Um, we're scheduled for tonight's meeting from oh, 06 to 8 o'clock. We're, we're about 5 till 8 now. And there's still 15 or so hands up and a number of questions that are coming onto the, the chat that we can see as panelists. So um, how, how about this? I just want to uh, just propose something here, especially to the, the director and, and the fish program director. How about we just go to uh, 8.30? We'll try to take as many questions as we can during that time. And and folks, what, what, we'll, what we'll also do is ask you to also go ahead and, and put your question in the chat. And what we'll do is we'll download the, the chat materials for, from this meeting and then uh, do our best to, to provide some responses and then post that to the website associated with this meeting. So I think that's a, a way forward. I wanna pause here just to see if, if there's any concerns and otherwise we'll proceed. All right, thanks director. Okay, Leah, let's, let's go to the next uh, question, please. Okay, our next hand is from Peter. Peter, go ahead. You guys there? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, so I have several questions. I'm a native from uh, Woodby Island, lived here my whole life for 40 some years. And uh, I've just seen a lot of things change and a lot of questions more than answers. So um, I have several and I'll try to make it quick. So first off, you were talking about the coho and I'm basically on here for blackmouth, but coho, the biggest thing was you said that you could do beach fishing that wouldn't impact anything with the black mouth or, or king salmon going in and out. Um, when you know that you've met your needs at the hatchery, why can't we uh, get extended fishing? You know, I'm a would-be islander. I, I fish on the beach. I'm a beach fisherman, basically, for coho. Um, that's my first question. Um, and then the black mouth questions later. So... Do you want me to ask one at a time, or would you guys like to just do it all together? One at a time, you know, and let's, let's, track. Let's do the first question, we'll do the second one, and then we'll keep okay. rolling here. Yep. Go, go ahead. So is the coho. So why 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 won't you open it for beat fishing after you've reached your hatchery goals? And this year was was one of those exceptions that... We had more fish than you needed, and we could have kept fishing on the beach, and it didn't open. You know, it didn't stay going. I mean, coho is the lowest on the totem pole other than pink salmon. So, Peter, I want to make sure I'm, I'm following your question. Are you yeah. talking about beach fishing for coho in Marine Area 9? Correct. And are you talking about beyond kind of the end of the season, I think yes. this year will be extended into October. Yes. Gotcha. And I thank you guys for that, but it, it should keep going, I think, especially uh, with the fish. So uh, I appreciate that, uh, Peter. And uh, I, you'll probably remember back, uh, you know, in the, the mid 20 teens that yep. uh, we actually carved out some beach fishing when we had a bunch <laughs> of other coho seasons closed. So, um, correct. That's something that we can consider definitely uh, going forward this year. I think one of the challenges for us, uh, because there's so much beach access in Marine Area 9, it's really hard for us to get an assessment of kind of what that effort and catch looks like. Not that, you know, we need to have an exact number, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll add that to our list of considerations for this year. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I think you're right. Uh, I think the amount of beach fishermen and that opportunity, uh, you know, the the resources, uh, you know, obviously not knowing forecasts yet, um, 
but the relative impact of that fishery uh, on those coho stocks would be would be relatively low. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you guys are pretty right on with our summer uh, king season. I mean, I know it's crazy out there. We got a lot of people out there more than ever. So um, the biggest thing that I was thinking about was the area nine, area six east, um, area eight two blackmouth. It hasn't been open for a few years and there's a lot of guys around here that that's how we feed our families. So did you guys get that? So I think uh, I'll, I'll take a stab. I saw uh, Derek turned his camera on there. Um, I touched on it a little bit in, in my presentation and I think Derek may have touched on it briefly too. Um, those winter fishing opportunities are really expensive on our stocks of concern, um, uh, particularly the Stillaguamish stock. And uh, you know, as I stated in my uh, my section, um, in recent years, you know, because we have such a limited amount of Chinook impacts, uh, anglers have preferred to use those available impacts towards summer fishing opportunity. I think uh, we've done, uh, you know, in previous years during North of Falcon, we've taken a look at. Uh, you know, what it would mean if we were to open some of those fisheries and the reductions that we would have to take in those summertime fisheries are basically almost to the, the point of no summer fishing just to allow for some winter fishing opportunity. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of stop there and see if Derek has anything he wants to add to what I said. I think that was a great response, Mark, and um, you kind of um, uh, captured most of what I was going to say. I, I did notice that Peter had spoken specifically to Area 8, too. I guess the other consideration there when we think about Chinook is that for the past few years, we've been below our low abundance thresholds for some of the Skagit stocks, and last year in particular, Snohomish was also of concern. So given that there are so many stocks of concern right there for Chinook in that in that uh, Area 8, it's it's been a little bit of a challenge in recent years. Okay, our next hand is from David. David, go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, thanks. Uh, just one uh, comment and a question. Uh, first comment is just to consider how you schedule the seasons. Uh, you end up creating a little bit of a bonanza mentality. Um, you know, if only Area 11 is open, um, say in June, it gets all the pressure and we blow through quota. And it may be something where if all the areas open around a similar time, you're going to spread that pressure out. Uh, you're seeing increased, you know, anglers in your numbers, but you're really forcing that same group in all the different areas. And potentially those anglers are double counted. Um, my question deals with the stilly, though. Uh, what are we doing besides just, you know, keep reducing recreational angler opportunities to bring back that stock? Is there anything else that we can do? Maybe using the Scotties, you know, egg incubators that go into the rivers or what else besides, you know, kind of taking it off the back of the recreation angler just to um, decrease our catch to bring that fish back. What else can we do? Well, maybe I'll take a stab and, and see if there's anybody else on the team that wants to speak to this. Um, there's been an incredible amount of effort that has gone into uh uh, working on uh, different recovery and um, uh, other conservation impacts in the Stillaguamish. Uh, that's spe specifically around uh, habitat uh, protection and uh, improvement. Um, there's been quite a bit of uh, uh, um, staff time, uh, legislative support, um, uh, you know, other forms of support that have gone in to help rebuild that stock. Um, so I see Derek turned his, his camera on. I don't know if he wants to speak, but I think, you know, uh, we're really at the point from fisheries that we've done all we can. And I, and I don't want to move past this without really acknowledging that the Stillaguamish tribe uh, has also made some great sacrifices in their fisheries, um, you know, right alongside the state uh, to allow for, you know, the recovery and rebuilding of this the stock in, in their native river. Um, and, and I wouldn't want to kind of pass this item without acknowledging, you know, uh, kind of the shared sacrifice that we have as co-managers. 
if I could add a little bit to that, Mark, um, you touched a little bit on on the habitat and uh, some of the fishery side of things. Um, maybe just two other actions that I might mention is that um, through our Pacific Salmon Treaty, through negotiations that occurred there, there are limits on the Canadian ISBM fisheries now. Those were first uh, agreed to in 2019 for Stiligwamish. So there's um, Canadian management objectives that are established in, in some of their fisheries. Um, and then in addition to that, um, and more from the modeling side, uh, something that I'm a little bit excited about is that we've been um, funding different projects uh, through the Pacific Salmon Treaty um, to um, uh, uh, identify kind of what changes we could make to habitat um, or um, what factors best affect kind of Stiligwamish productivity so that we can uh, direct future projects to maximizing uh, uh, increased Stiligwamish productivity in that system. Thanks, Derek. And I just would want to call out there's a there's a pretty informative uh, web page uh, on our site for if you uh, go to our our, our home page in the search function, type in Stiligwamish restoration. There's there's quite a, a suite of of actions that the department and the tribe and other partners are doing to try to try to recover Stiligwamish and 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 in really in, in support and acknowledgement of what a constraining stock uh, the Stiligwamish population is. Okay, our next hand is from Mike. Mike, go ahead. Uh, you guys have a tough job. Um, I've got a lot of my stuff already in the comments. Um, I guess the one that I want, uh, the two that I want answered, or would like an answer to, are the uh, Muckleshoot releasing um, 1 million unclipped coho, and um, that just seems like that's going to cause negative impacts on 9 and 10. Um, we're going to be throwing away a lot of fish. We're going to be encountering a lot of fish, which is then going to, you know, impact, have impacts. Um, so are you changing your process in any way to account for these millions of fish, um, that are coming? And we already saw them this last year. They were all like dollar, dollar bill sized fish that we were just, you know, we could just tell, oh, they released them. Here they are. So how are you not going to shut us down? That's one. The other one is uh, I'm actually interested in uh, acquiring your design documents, if you have them, on uh, how you um, actually estimate uh, encounters. Um, all of your data that you use, you know, for your observations become estimates. All of this stuff feeds into that. I'd actually like to write a program to duplicate that and uh, run some sensitivity analysis on the parameters and uh, understand, you know, get a sense that, you know, yeah, this is good science or there, there's some problems here with uh, with some of the uh, the math, the statistics. So is that possible to get? So I can answer that last question. We do have a document that talks about how we do the estimate calculation. It's a, a PDF document that we publish. Um, if you send me an email, I can get that out to you. Um, so just, yeah, just shoot me an email. And I'll send you along that document so you can take a look at it. And then if you have any more questions, just feel free to, to get back to us. Um, the question about the, the Muckle Shoe Coho, uh, one thing I want to remind folks is that um, Central and South, South Sound Coho um, is non-selective. So whether the fish are area 10 and area 11 are non-selective for Coho. So um, so unmarked Coho in that, in the those areas wouldn't affect it. Um, I, I'm going to let Mark jump in and, and kind of give a better answer, but that's just one, one thing I wanted to point out as well. So I I, I guess uh, I hear this allegation quite a bit uh, that the Muckleshoot tribe is uh, releasing millions of unmarked coho uh, into Central Sound uh, through their net pen program. Um, I feel like we have a really good working relationship with the Muckleshoot tribe. I don't have the, the release numbers or the release information in front of me, um, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that, you know, uh, we, work, we work together on the marking programs. Uh, we work really closely with our co-managers on, uh, you know, uh, the, the marking statewide uh, of, these, of these stocks. Um, I don't, uh, uh, like I said, I can't confirm or deny at this point because I haven't looked at the information about uh, whether uh, the Muckleshoot program is entirely unmarked, uh, but I don't I don't think that's the case.
Okay, our next question is from David. David, go ahead. I think you came back to another, the same David that asked a previous question. Um, uh, just to follow up, because I think I was muted there um, in regards to the Stilly, though. Um, I know Scotty's offers some um, in-stream incubators where you take some of the fish and they're stripped of their um, their eggs and then allowed to uh, essentially reproduce or have those eggs um, uh, in those incubators in the river to come back. And you get a much higher uh, hatch rate, around 98%, instead of the 2% you get of the wild. Has anything been considered um, like that for the Stilly? Do you want me to take this one, team? So I, uh, I, I, I don't know if specifically if those things have been considered for the Stilly. The hatchery, uh, from what I understand, the hatchery program on the Stilly is a is a conservation program. So it's really it's not meant for you know like a harvest program. Um, so you know uh, there's other limits that are that are part of that production that try to meet those conservation goals as a as a conservation hatchery program rather than uh, a program destined for uh, additional harvest opportunities. Thanks, Mark. Our next question is from Alex. Alex, go ahead. Great. Hey, thanks, guys. Wow. There is no possible way for for your stakeholders, us, to divulge into everything that you gave to us here tonight. Um, I, I suppose I should thank you for at least the opportunity that we have. Um, there is so much to go over here. I would hope that in the essence of a true town hall, that maybe in, in future events that um, it, it is more guided towards your stakeholders, the ones that um, you actually represent. So I'll, I'll try to maybe go over some of this as quickly as I can. Um, I see a concerted effort to, to model things with a catch effort uh, strategy or, or a, a catch per day strategy. Um, I, I think it's incredibly important to note that that catch success is going to be determined about by, frankly, derby style openings that we're now subjected to um, openings that that force us to be in one specific area at one specific time. And 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 as to what's been talked about is as far as even area seven or nine, we're guaranteed a three day opener. So of course the pressure in those areas are going to be increased. And of course we're going to see catch per day correlated, um, you know, to that season structure. I, I would, I will, I'm going to make sure I take a, a moment here real quick to speak to, whoever else is might still be on this call throughout all this endured all this that folks don't get discouraged folks this was a lot of information that was forced onto us in a very quick matter that is very hard to digest i myself am having problems with digesting and and going through all of it and being able to keep track of, of everything that was discussed. Don't be discouraged, folks. Please continue to stay involved. Continue to participate in the meetings as they're scheduled. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Don't be discouraged, folks. Now, as we move forward through the NOF process and to these, these next meetings that are going to be in front of us, um, I'd hope that we don't spend 75% of our time reviewing things that um, that are, are pertinent or that, that the department feels is pertinent, that we actually allow opportunity for us to get to the brass tacks of things and to get to questions and concerns and to get to us actually being able to ask you on, on accountability issues and, and how things are being managed or, or mismanaged as some may put. Um, and, and so I do have a couple actual topics I want to discuss here. 
Um, for, hey, hey, Alex, I no, really I, appreciate that you have a topic. So why don't you ask a question and then will you, you, you stated a lot here. Uh, good comments. We've been trying to make this information accessible to all. Why don't you ask a question and then we'll move on to others. I know you also well, want to get to I, more I, questions I, I, as well. Ask one quick question, Nate, here first. It was, and, and first, I'd say that any notion that, that an advisory member should not ask any technical question during any of these town halls is, is absolutely asinine as far as I'm concerned. Any advisor should be able to ask any technical question and have you answer it in front of a public forum. But I will. Absolutely, one, Alex. You know, just very quickly on, on over that. Over 20,000, over 20. Alex, I don't know, uh, Leah, we can bring him back on. I just I just want to um, acknowledge here that uh, we actually had a comment from an advisor suggests that we try to prioritize some of the comments from others because there's going to be opportunities to interact with staff at an advisory call on Friday. So that, okay. that was we're trying to get to as many questions as we can and Totally. Advisors also have a lot of access to staff and have a lot of questions. And so that wasn't out of disrespect. That was trying to acknowledge that there's a lot of other people, as you acknowledge, are trying to learn this and we're trying to get to their questions. But go ahead and ask your question and then we'll move to someone else. Yeah, totally. This meeting wasn't announced to the advisors until after the department posted on their social media. But Sam, Salmon, quote, Salmon are an icon, quote, the mandate for the department and primary goal is to sustain these Salmon runs. Uh, what is the state's position on over 20,000 Chinook caught during BC trawl catch? When you have to abide by Pacific Salmon Treaty and Pacific Salmon Commission uh, regulations, when we, when the state of Washington, whom you, whom you represent, when you go to those meetings and when you participate in these commissions, what is the state's position on the excess of Chinook bycatch during ground trawl seasons i'm not sure who's best to answer that question alex because nobody on this call uh sits in those um you know kind of high level chinook discussions uh other than maybe dr dapp as our representative on the chinook technical committee um I think that's a, a, a fairly recent revelation. I'm not sure that there's even been discussion on that uh, at the PSC, uh, different uh, committees or groups that, that talk through these things. Um, obviously the state of Washington has no uh, authority over the government of Canada, right? We're part of a treaty with the United States and Canada and the United and Washington is part of that you know, the U.S. part of that treaty. So, uh, you know, although Washington has a stake and is a big player in these discussions, it's it's a larger problem than just a Washington problem. Thank you, Mark. Our next question is from Brett. Brett, go ahead. Yeah, hi. thanks for the time tonight. Um, as I'm sure many on this call, I'm one that is a traveling fisherman. I try to fish for these precious animals around the state as often as I can, but I am a resident uh, fisherman of Area 11 and live mi minutes from the Green River Hatchery. Um, I think what I would want a better understanding of from the commission, and so I have a question and a suggestion, would be around the Area 11 kind of choppy way of the season's opening. Um, it doesn't seem to benefit these sublegals or unmarked um, returning salmon in the month of June and even in the first parts of July. And so as an angler that tries to get out there as often as I can, I would propose having that area open similar to nine and 10, that it would one, I think have less impact or keep us on the water longer, um, as well as spread out the pressure as many people have noted on this call. Um, and so I'd like to see or understand the benefit that it has to the June opener. I understand there's a thousand fish that return to Minter Creek around that time, but to me, it seems that more net pens or returning jacks are an issue. 
um, which I, I don't know how you guys determine a returning Jack or a sub legal in some of those encounter rates. And I'd like to maybe get a better idea of that. Um, but I'll leave it with my suggestion. One, I'd like to propose something that some type of managed volunteer program. Um, I've planted trees at my green river. I've clipped fins at the hatchery and something to the effect that where if an angler is willing to put in a certain amount of hours throughout the year as a volunteer effort through some type of license mandated program that that would allow for them to keep maybe one um, unmarked fish a year. I think it would be a good way of adjoining maybe the separation between the angler and the state and organizations as a way of trying to bridge that gap that I think is pretty prevalent sometimes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Mark, are you going to get that? Or are we going to move? Next question. Okay. <laughs> Jesse. Sorry, I, was, I was distracted and didn't hear the entire question. If somebody on wants to repeat it or take it for me, I'd really appreciate it. I apologize for that. Mark, what, what, there was a, a couple comments in there. There was a, some suggestions on Marine Area 11, so I think that we can take that into account. And then there was a suggestion about you know, is there a way for us to to reward um, volunteers that kind of go that extra mile, uh, volunteer at a hatchery, engage in a restoration effort, and could they have a an unmarked fish tag uh, as a way to kind of contribute? So, I think it's a it's a it's a thought for consideration, and I think we can go to Jesse. Thanks, Nate. I appreciate that. Jesse, go ahead. We can hear you, Jesse. Oh, perfect. Great. First, I want to say, you know, thanks so much for uh, taking the time this evening. Uh, I know it's a, a very, you know, complex process and there's, you know, a whole lot that needs to come together just for us to get on the water. So it's really great to get some time this evening. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one, what are your thoughts on shifting to more terminal fisheries? Like I, I know the bubble fisheries uh, and marine areas have been much more consistent. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I think it's uh, a great suggestion. Uh, I think it's something that we've been thinking about uh, for a while. Uh, once again, um, we'd have to be strategic. Uh, you know, I think some of the the successful one is around the Talela bubble. Um, you know, uh, we could uh, consider some other areas for that, but I think you know we'd want to be really thoughtful about it. Um, uh, as far as where those might occur, where it made the most sense, uh, where we've seen kind of, you know, the bigger reductions in marine area opportunities, we'd probably want to focus uh, our thoughts there uh, just to provide some additional opportunity, maybe where it's been lost in the recent past, if we could. So uh, I don't think it's a bad suggestion. Um, I, I think it is something that we've kind of considered. It's, it's harder, uh, especially when you get down to the the modeling and the evaluation pieces um, to, to start splitting off marine areas and coded wire tag recoveries and try to make assumptions in the modeling about you know, uh, what kind of impacts you may have in a, in a smaller geographic area uh, as opposed to kind of the larger marine area. Um, you know, uh, the, the data that's collected when we do collect coded wire tags on the back about fishing location, uh, isn't always that consistent or reliable. Um, so it, it is a piece of data, but I think it just, as we, as I said, as we move towards kind of reducing down larger marine areas and trying to evaluate those impacts, uh, uh, it just complicates the puzzle just a little bit more. Okay, thanks, Mark. Our next hand is from George. George, go ahead. George, I have prompted you to unmute. Oh, sorry. There, thanks. Um, I had a, a great time fishing this year in areas nine and 10. I'm actually relatively new to salmon fishing. Um, and I dropped by the locks uh, and the locks uh, found that they, their returns of Chinook were about twice the five and 10 year averages. And their coho was about four times the return. 
And I'm guessing that that was not part of the original forecast. And I'm wondering, is, is there no way to figure that into the season? Because, of course, Area 10 closed early. <clears throat> so, uh, again, George, we, we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, once those fish are in, in the locks and counted, uh, they're not in Marine Area 10 anymore. So they're not necessarily available for harvest in that marine area fishery. Um, and we, and as we've talked about, um, our ability to assess what stocks were impacting in the marine area down to the stock specific level is not something that we can do like real time in season. Um, we've, we've thought about ways of trying to get at that question, but it really just becomes really daunting uh, when you try to uh, think through the complexities of all the different stocks and populations and management units that Kyle spoke about earlier, uh, and all the different marine areas and the impacts on those stocks, uh, it kind of becomes unwieldy. We have had instances in the past where, uh, you know, we're able to take advantage of those uh, uh, different abundances that show themselves. Those primarily occur in the freshwater fisheries. Uh, where we're able to provide either unexpected opportunity or increased opportunity in those freshwater areas based on the tools that we use and agree with with the co-manager. So uh, it's challenging. Uh, you know, I, I think that's the, the easiest, best answer I can come up with. And Kyle and Kirsten, if you have anything to add. No, that's right on, Mark. Uh, with all the stocks out there, we don't have a way to know when marine waters if we have more total abundance than we expected, if we have less total abundance, if we have more hatchery fish, if we have more wild fish, there's just no way to sort that all out. Yes, we get data on individual returns once fish start entering places like the locks or hatchery racks, but there's just no real-time way to update the information we have that we use to plan marine fisheries and no way to increase opportunity based on that. So, um... We have uh, at least nine hands up uh, still, and uh, we're, we're coming up close to the end of time with the, the overage that we've added. So what I would uh, ask is we'll, we'll uh, have Joseph be the, the last uh, question. For those that still have your hand up, if you haven't already and you want to submit a question, please put it in the chat. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll go back through the, the chat, identify uh, themes and common questions, and then uh, do our best to provide some answers and post that uh, here in the next few business days. But let's go ahead to, to Joseph's question, and then we'll probably start heading towards closing out the meeting. Go ahead, Joseph. Hi there. I had a couple points. Uh, Marine Area 11, um, it was a very disappointing season. Uh, I know that most sports fishermen feel that the natives are getting 75% or more of the fish. I, I know this from crab fishing. When I launch my boat in May and the, the shores are blanketed with native traps. And when it comes to our turn, there's a Sunday and Monday opportunity to crab fish. That's just crab. It goes on for the salmon too. We, we, Really, I, I feel we don't get our share. Uh, is there any kind of uh, transparency where we can see the native catch limits? And I know they've proposed that they be on our, uh, they, they monitor our catches. Can we monitor theirs? So I'll, Again, I'll try to take a stab and, and Kyle or others, if you want to jump in. Uh, we work really cooperatively with our co-managers. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities where uh, we are uh, alongside their staff, uh, sampling their fisheries uh, with them, collecting code of wire tag and catch information uh, uh, right alongside them, uh, processing fish, all, all sorts of activities like that. Um, I can't speak for the crab fishery and, and how that's managed. Um, you know, there may be opportunities uh, in different stocks or in different watersheds uh, throughout Puget Sound where the tribes are getting more than the state for a particular stock or a particular management unit. And that often fluctuates year to year. 
Um, we do have reports that we uh, uh, um, file for, uh, you know, uh, our ESA reports that we produce uh, that have, uh, you know, state and tribal catch in them. Uh, we are endeavoring to make those uh, available on our website in the very near future. Uh, we're collecting lots of postseason evaluations uh, as part of our uh, recently adopted North of Falcon policy to try to do a better job of, of making that content public available uh, and public facing for, for everybody to evaluate. Um, but the reality is, is that uh, it's a shared resource and we do our best to balance the, the, the tribal uh, needs for harvest and, uh, and honoring their treaty rights, uh, as well as fulfilling uh, you know, the needs of our fishers and our constituents uh, with the available resources. So I, I think I captured everything there. Uh, anybody else wanna add? I might just add, Mark, I, early in the meeting, I gave a really simplified version of explanation for mixed stock fisheries and talked about if we have one ESA listed stock out there with so many impacts available and we divide those up between state and tribal fisheries. The tribal fisheries tend to be concentrated in extreme terminal marine waters and freshwater areas, really focused on the stock returning to that watershed. We choose to have state fisheries out in these mixed stock areas that are impacting stocks going all around Puget Sound and outside of Puget Sound. And it means we use our impacts differently. So we're not trying to divide up all the harvestable fish in Puget Sound and divide them 50-50. We're trying to figure out how to take the make the best use of our impacts on particularly these ESA listed stocks to access hatchery stocks. And that means um, we have a higher impact than our tribal co-managers on some, some stocks and a lower impact on some stocks. Um, and that's just part of the complication of all this is we're making a choice to go fish these mixed terminal areas and it makes our fishery planning more complicated and assessing how the how the, the harvest allocation works out over time more complicated. All right. Well, um wanna just check in with the director, see if there's any closing remarks on his end. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Uh well, first, I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. I know this is an investment of your time. Obviously, there's a whole lot to cover here. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I recognize there's a lot of frustration out there. That's why we want to have these meetings so you can hear from staff directly. I am going to double down on what I said in the beginning. The staff on this call do know these fisheries. The staff on these calls do participate in these fisheries, and the staff on these calls fight for every last fish they can provide to the non-treaty side. It's a complex business, but know that that's what they're trying to do. They also know the legal, technical, biological constraints we have to deal with. So within those constraints, can we do better? Always. We will always strive to do better. We want to hear from you. We're wide, our ears are wide open to hear ideas. Uh, I just ask that you come in with that collaborative effort to recognize there are constraints. Within those constraints, we will do everything we can for you. With that, I appreciate you all investing a, a, a whole night with us. And uh, as you saw in the beginning here of the schedule, there are lots of meetings to continue the discussion. So thank you for your input. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Director. And thanks to everybody that, that was able to join us tonight. We will uh, download the chat and do our best to identify those key questions and themes and, and, and post the questions along with our responses here in the next few days. I wanna thank the, 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 the whole team here that took the time to, to prepare the presentations, share this information, and also thank the, the team that helped us uh, producing the town the virtual town hall tonight and helping uh, with the mechanics of Zoom. So. Uh, our website is a great resource here for the North of Falcon meetings that are coming up uh, in uh, February through April and look for additional opportunities there to engage in the salmon season setting process. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody.